Well, good morning. We're uh, pleased to have you all here in Houston and here at the Baker Institute. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Ambassador Derision, who's the founding director of the Baker Institute, who had a very illustrious career in foreign service before he came to this position, serving as ambassador to uh, Israel and as ambassador to the Syrian Arab Republic, and uh, has played an important part uh, since his time in, in Houston, uh, providing advice on the Middle East and has uh, been a major contributor to the Iraqi study group. And uh, we are very fortunate to have him here at the Baker Institute. And under his leadership, this institute, uh, Policy Institute, has become one of the most leading uh, policy institutes in the United States. So without any further ado, I'll introduce the ambassador. Thank you very much, George, and uh, good morning. Uh, looking at the list of participants uh, with all the brain power in this room, if we cannot solve the problems of space, I think we're, I'm going to become very pessimistic. But we're delighted to have you uh, here today. I would like to formally welcome you to the Baker Institute and to the second International uh, Space Medicine Summit. Uh, the Baker Institute is proud to contribute uh, to Rice University's longtime involvement with uh, US, the U.S. space program, and now to extend that involvement uh, to the international space community. In September 1962, President John F. Kennedy caught the attention of the world by announcing here at Rice University, at the stadium here, that the United States would embark on a manned mission to the moon. He vowed that space would not be governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom and peace. He further vowed that we shall not see space filled with weapons of mass destruction, but with instruments of knowledge and understanding. It is in this spirit that the Baker Institute and the Baylor College of Medicine convened the first International Space Medicine Summit last year, and we are here today to further uh, that vision. We felt that it is important, if not essential, to increase communications, cooperation, and collaboration among the world's top physicians and scientists in space medicine and space life sciences if humans are to successfully explore space and if we are going to be able to protect the well-being of the brave men and women who, that embark on missions in space. We also feel that by working together we can further enhance life on Earth by applying the resultant advances in human knowledge and technology acquired through living and working in space. Last year's summit proved to be a great success, and the participants expressed a strong desire to further this important conversation. Now, this summit comes after a year of, of significant accomplishment in human spaceflight. In February of this year, the European Columbus module was delivered to the International Space Station, and in March, the Space Shuttle delivered the Japanese logistic uh, module, the initial element of Japan's Kibo Laboratory, and Canada's dexterous manipulator. That's a term I would like to use in diplomacy, but I won't go there. Uh, an another major milestone was achieved in April when Jules Vann, the Uni European Automated Transfer Vehicle, successfully docked with the International Space Station. In addition, later this month, the Space Shuttle will carry the Japanese pressurized module and the Japanese remote manipulator to the Space Station. So the International Space Station continues to grow in its capability as a research platform and in its ability to achieve the objectives of its international partners. However, there are future uncertainties, as you all know, that have been created by the decision to stop flying the space shuttle. In order to continue to operate and fulfill its objectives and potential, the space station will need the logistical support of our international partners, and that can only happen if we continue to work together. Much has been accomplished, yet much more needs to be done. In the face of this and future challenges, we must continue to work together to be successful in this historic endeavor and in the future exploration of space. When Vladimir Putin was here in November 2001, he declared that the, the successful United States-Russian collaboration and collaborative efforts in space should be the model for future cooperation in other areas of mutual interest. 
Now, some of those other areas of mutual interest haven't proved that promising, but we certainly do uh, adhere to his words in terms of space cooperation. It is appropriate that the Baker Institute's senior fellow in space policy, George Abbey, who opened up the session, the former head of the Johnson Space Center, and one of the main figures in building the relationship in space between the United States and Russia, along with Bobby Alford, the chancellor of the Baylor College of Medicine and a chairman and CEO of the National Spice Biomedical Research Institute, have organized this summit. And I laud you for all the hard work you did to bringing this summit uh, <clears throat> to reality. So I would like to recognize them for their forward-looking vision. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce the president of Rice University, David Liebren. <clears throat> David Liebren is the seventh president of this university, and he became that on July of 2004. He is, a leading, he is leading Rice through a period of incredible growth. Uh, you could see all the cranes flying uh, on campus. Uh, but more importantly, based on a 10-point vision for the second century he launched during his first three years in office. Uh, we have some $850 million of construction projects on campus, foreseeing a 30% growth in the undergraduate student body, and a 10-story research center to deepen Rice's collaboration with the Texas Medical Center just across the street. David has emphasized building Rice, Rice's international presence with active outreach to Asia and Latin America. And now I think he's going to be taking us into space today, so we'll see how far our outreach goes. Please join me in welcoming David Liebren to the podium. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ed. I want to add my welcome to all of you to Rice University. I want to especially welcome officials from NASA and especially from our neighbor and longtime collaborator, the Johnson Space Center. Welcome those from other nations, from Russia and Canada, Japan, across Europe, and US scientists from across the nation. I want to add my thanks to George Abbey and Bobby Alford, the organizers of this conference. We are honored at Rice to host the second International Space Medicine Summit. We at Rice are proud of having been part of the space program from the beginning, with the Department of Space Science being created in 1963. 14 of our graduates have been selected as astronauts, and I would suspect that Outside the military colleges, that's probably on a per capita basis one of the highest in the country. We're pleased to work together with the institutions of the Texas Medical Center and especially Baylor College of Medicine, which under Bob, Bobby Alford is leading the National Consortium on Space Medicine Research under the National Space Biomedical Research Institute. Now, I have to confess, I was a little surprised when they asked me to make opening remarks at this gathering. I was reminded a little bit of the story of the lawyer, and I'm a lawyer, who had studied civil engineering as an undergraduate. For those of you not from this country, you know, we don't study law as undergraduates, but this lawyer, not unusually, had studied civil engineering and gone on to a distinguished career in law, retired, and then finally passed away and went on to heaven and was greeted at the gates and was informed that each of the new inhabitants, so to speak, would be asked to give a lecture on any topic that he or she might choose. And this lawyer, having labored long throughout his life in the field of, of corporate law, decided that he would go back to this early love. He had always maintained an interest in civil engineering, in particular in, in floods. And so he thought he would go, and they had a great library, and he would go and do some research and prepare his sort of lecture, and he would sort of talk about floods. And as he got up to speak, he sort of surveyed the audience and just had a moment of pause when he recognized Noah sitting in the audience. <laughs> That's a little bit how I feel 
here today. I don't think there's a lot that I can tell this group about space or space medicine. As you all know, a little over 47 years ago last fall, Yuri Gagarin was launched into space aboard the Vostok 1. Of course, this wasn't the first flight on which space medicine, in some sense, was brought to bear. We shouldn't overlook the efforts to assure both the well-being of the first animals launched into space and the use of those animals to learn what was necessary to assure human safety. The first monkey was sent into space on a V-2 rocket in 1949. And of course, the first mammal launched into space was the dog Laika in 1957, although Laika unfortunately did not survive that flight. From the beginning, man's space was coupled with the need to take care of the medical needs of space travelers and assure their safe return and equally important, their subsequent health and productive life. The Soviet achievements, first with Sputnik and then with Vostok, were truly momentous. This was the time of what we call the Cold War, a war of everything but armies and sometimes even armies. The reaction in the United States to this great achievement of mankind was fear, suspicion, and indeed embarrassment. First Sputnik's unmanned flight and then Vostok's manned flight galvanized the United States into competitive action. Just weeks after the Vostok flight, President Kennedy made the following announcement. If we are to win the battle that is now going on around the world between freedom and tyranny, the dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. Since early in my term, our efforts in space have been under review. We have examined where we are strong and where we are not. Now it is time to take longer strides, time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to clearly take a leading role in space achievement which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. A year after that, in the famous speech mentioned by Ambassador Jurigian, made just a few hundred yards from where we sit, I think in that direction, in the giant stadium out there, Kennedy expanded on the reasons for going into space. But why, some say the moon, why choose this as our goal? And they may ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? <laughs> we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize, and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are willing to postpone, and one which we intend to win, and others too. The rhetoric, like the allusion to Rice playing the University of Texas in football, was one of winners and losers. I should perhaps be candid in saying, in terms of the Rice UT, we mostly ended up on the wrong end of that equation. It was for most part the rhetoric of competition rather than cooperation. It was a rhetoric of what we as a nation could achieve. Now Kennedy did emphasize in his speech the broad benefits that would come from space travel. He said, we set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. The world has changed a great deal in the nearly half century since then. 
The Soviet Union has broken up into its constituent pieces. Other nations have entered the world of space in important ways. Less than five years ago, China became the third nation to launch one of its own citizens in space when Yang Liwei orbited aboard the Shenzhou 5. But perhaps an equally important milestone was 30 years ago, on March 2nd, 1978, when for the first time a nation's spacecraft carried a foreign national. Vladimir Remek, a Czech citizen, orbited aboard Soyuz 28. Since then, nationals of at least 28 countries have flown in space. The International Space Station has been visited by the nationals of 16 countries, including the newest category of space traveler, the space tourist. In 1961 and 62, President Kennedy emphasized in his speeches the importance of the United States winning the space race. Whatever the high-minded words, however widespread the benefits to mankind may have been, the competition in space was defined in largely nationalist terms in a bipolar world. Today, it seems to me, a different paradigm is evident. Space has become an international venture. Space stations and space flights are inhabited by multiple nationalities. And while only three nations might participate directly in manned launches, Several more, many more, have undertaken unmanned spaceflight. Many of those nations are represented here today. Even at Rice, we are pleased to count not only American astronauts among our graduates, but at least one foreign one. Space has the potential to become the common venture of mankind, both a symbol and reality of cooperation among nations. That aspiration today is not without its threats. Increasing restrictions on technology and foreign access to technology may make it difficult to open programs to foreign citizens. With the end of the space shuttle program in less than two years and U.S. involvement in the International Space Station in seven or eight, the future of the International Space Program remains to some degree in doubt. So the question is no longer simply whether we choose to go into space, whether we choose to go to Mars and beyond, but how we choose to go into space. What are the earthly paradigms that we seek to take into space with us? And what are those that we reject? Relatively early on, for example, we largely rejected the idea of space-based weapons or defense systems in space. As Kennedy remarked in his speech at space, at Rice, space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. Today, that paradigm is in doubt. At the beginning of his speech, Kennedy noted, we meet at a college noted for knowledge, in a city noted for progress, in a state noted for strength, and we stand in need of all three. For we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. Today, much more than in the past, our universities and colleges are known not simply for the knowledge they produce, but for the international bridges that they build. At Rice, like most other top universities around the country, about half of our graduate students in science and engineering come from other countries. In our undergraduate student body, in about three years, we have tripled the representation of foreign students from less than 3% to about nine. We see an important part of our mission as bringing people together from around the world, educating them in differences, and contributing to the building of a global culture of understanding, cooperation, and leadership. 
That is the paradigm we hope the space program will seek in today's environment. Our economy also has become more internationalized. Many of our most important enterprises are foreign owned or partly foreign owned. Our companies not only sell their goods all over the world, they compete for talent all over the world. In some aspects, at least, we are indeed living in a borderless world. And yet, as we pursue more internationalist goals and aspirations, we face a resurgence of borders and barriers and nationalist thinking. In this, our own decade of both hope and fear, we cannot build security through weapons alone. We cannot build security through fences. And we cannot build through security through restrictions on information. We can instead build security, at least in part, through understanding and cooperation and through contributing to human progress and opportunity and the alleviation of human suffering. Even as we meet today, we are witnessing almost unfathomable, depth, unfathomable depths and magnitudes of human suffering in Myanmar, in China, and in parts of Africa. We do not know where all the answers will come from in addressing these problems. But given what we have learned from the past, it seems some of them will come from space. In the areas of health alone, space travel necessitates improved methods of treating medical problems remotely and enabling space travelers to take a more active and personal role in self-diagnosis and treatment. These will bring great applications to Earth as well. From the website of the NSBI, I even learned about self-guided conflict management, which could help people live more peaceably together. So I hope out of this conference will come not only a renewed and reinvigorated effort toward making important scientific discoveries in the area of space health, but also a renewed effort toward making that effort the common endeavor of mankind. So that when we say, as Kennedy did, that our goals in space will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, that we will mean our human energies and skills across the globe. That is what I perceive this conference is about. And I wish you every success in both that endeavor and in the scientific ones as well. Welcome to Rice. Well, thank you, President Lieberman. I think you said it very well, as, uh, as did the ambassador. Uh, I think our future clearly lies in international cooperation. And as they pointed out, we started this activity in space uh, during a time of competition. And I think one of the great things that's happened over the years is that we moved away from that and that we're flying today the International Space Station and we're working together on that program and it's a successful program because we are working together. So we hope out of this, uh, this summit uh, we can establish further ties for collaborative research among uh, all the partners and among the institutions here in this country and around the world because I think it's going to be important to have that collaboration if we're going to be successful. There are, as the ambassador said, uncertainties in the program and if we're going to make the space station really fulfill its potential and do what I think it can do, provide the foundation for a human exploration of the universe that will take all of us working together to make it happen. And so we're looking for a, a very good uh, summit, uh, one that, uh, like last year, uh, had very frank and open discussions and uh, uninhibited discussions. So I, I hope that we can have uh, follow that format again during this, uh, this, this second conference. Uh, it's unfortunate that we didn't have some of the invitees from uh, the other nations who were, who were going to come that they're not here. But uh, we look on building that uh, relationship in the future. So uh, I'm very pleased to have you all here. We're looking forward to, again to a very open and frank uh, meeting uh, where we can 
hopefully establish uh, some really good relationships for the future. So let me introduce my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Bobby Alfred from uh, Baylor College of Medicine. President LeBron, uh, Ambassador Dridgen, uh, Mr. Abbey, it is indeed a very special pleasure for me to be able to welcome all of you today to this uh, International Space Medicine Summit. As an awful lot of work has gone into the development of this program, uh, focusing on how to promote collaboration and communication, cooperation, and I think that the setting is ideal for it at Rice University, and it. it uh, really promotes that, uh, those objectives. Um, I would like to uh, tell you how, how much many people have contributed to it, and yet I don't want to go through a laundry list of names necessarily, but let me tell you that really, uh, of course, NASA uh, and the uh, Russian uh, IBMP and, and Energia uh, have contributed greatly to the program over time and as have others, the European Space Agency and the, the Japanese uh, Agency. Uh, and we're, we couldn't have had the program we have today without uh, everyone's help and participation. I would like to point out a few uh, small changes in the program as uh, inevitably occur, I guess, in any kind of undertaking of this type. Uh, there is a panelist added to panel one uh, and it's Dr. James Tour, Professor James Tour at Rice University, who's uh, doing some very interesting work with the radiation and uh, mitigation of its effects. There is an addition to the panel three on space medicine, uh, and uh, that actually was an oversight uh, for which uh, I take the responsibility. Uh, Vladimir um, Matviev is uh, being added to that panel, um, and uh, we're very thrilled with that. As uh, you know, he's uh, at the Gagarin Center in uh, Russia and ha plays a major role in, in space flight, and has for years, is, is a cosmonaut. And then, uh, unbelievable as it always, always seems to occur, uh, we had uh, looked forward and had discussions with Sergei Krikalev, uh, and uh, as of uh, last week, and even earlier this week, I guess, he had hoped to come. However, he was uh, uh, re uh, more than requested, required to remain in Russia because of some important meetings. Uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier had gone to Russia to work on the new contract and agreements with uh, Russia about the Soyuz spacecraft. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Krikalov was a, a vital member for those discussions, and so he, he uh, was, uh, uh, as I say, required to stay there. The Chinese have been a challenge, and uh, it's interesting. I want to tell you that uh, uh, Leroy Chow has really been very helpful in this regard, and he has established strong communications with the Chinese uh, space program, and uh, they're very active communications, and uh, he's been to China several times, and he knows the program very well. Uh, last year, when we had this uh, problem, it was perhaps more or less our problem of not anticipating uh, how difficult it might be, although they did have a, 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 pro, a big meeting of their own in Beijing, which uh, interfered with their coming, uh, at least on a time basis. Uh, this year, it was the other way around. Uh, we were quite far ahead of the process, and Ambassador Dirigian had uh, really interceded in, in the highest uh, levels, and it wound up being a lower level there that basically didn't do its job. So uh, although it's, there's a, perhaps even a very slight chance that we might have uh, some of them appear, it's very doubtful. 
Now we've learned both sides of this story, so I suppose the next time we go about it, uh, we'll uh, hopefully uh, master the whole process uh, and it will be successful. I, we wanted to uh, emphasize the international nature of this uh, effort, uh, and that's why we've uh, done our best to uh, assemble the flags of the various nations that have been involved uh, in uh, space uh, biomedical research and in flying humans in space. Of course, uh, not all of the uh, countries represented by these flags have flown humans in space yet, but I think uh, uh, the aim and the goal is to uh, bring uh, about a, a real uh, cooperative and supportive environment to promote the objectives of uh, space flight and to be able to do the and accomplish the things that we all have uh, envisioned for the future. Um, you know, one thing that was mentioned by uh, by President LeBron is the importance of bridging sciences. You know, we've all been accustomed to silos, standing alone, and that's true in specialties in medicine. But uh, those uh, silos are being brought together into one uh, large community of science and, uh, and in, in medical practice as well. And I think uh, we see evidence of bridging of the sciences, a so-called coalition of them, uh, in a variety of areas. And I think one excellent example of it, uh, which was mentioned last year, is the uh, collaborative uh, uh, science uh, building that Rice University has uh, uh, begun. And you remember last year it was sort of a hole in the ground, and this year it's far more than a hole in the ground. It's a 500,000 square foot facility that is to promote collaborative research in the uh, basic medical sciences and the clinical medical sciences and foster translational research. So it's indeed a pleasure to welcome everyone here. I hope that if there's anything we can do to make your visit here more comfortable, you'll let us know. And if there are any other changes that come along, uh, we'll bring them to your attention. Um, with that, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and proceed with the uh, first panel. So if we would uh, come up and take your places, uh, we'll go ahead with that, uh, that part of the program. the chair. Уважаемые коллеги, 
dear colleagues and dear organizers of this wonderful symposium, I think that I will express everyone's opinion by thanking them on the behalf of all of us for the effort uh, that enable us to gather and exchange our views and opinions on the most modern and most serious aspects and the problems that we face in the piloted space flight and uh, where we are aiming for future studies uh, of space and um, unfortunately the further you go the more difficult it becomes to support uh, human life in space in our panel we will touch upon the problem on ensuring radiation safety specifically in uh, studying the moon and the uh, overall lunar operations. There is significant experience of orbital flight uh, from the standpoint of scientific and practical base. Therefore, we can expect that this problem will be resolved successfully in uh, the human flight to the moon, um, creating human base and a long-term scientific expedition for studying the moon. However, analysis shows that the conditions that currently exist at near-Earth flights, and I mean the radiation factor, for the lunar expeditions would require additional research and also additional solutions, additional measures that would enable one to count on safe human spaceflight to those areas. In the case of lunar flights, there will not be a protective effect of the magnetic field of the Earth, which is actually quite a powerful pr protective factor for the cosmonauts and astronauts in the orbital stations. Just a few examples, a few estimates that would enable us to feel how serious, how important this factor is. If you are looking at the impact of a space um, solar rays, which is one of the major factors of radiation uh, hazard in space. The protective effect of geomagnetic field is um, measured by the coefficient of uh, the lowering of the dose in orbit by 10,000 times, depending on the parameters of uh, the orbit, the turbulence of the field, uh, and the characteristics of the spectrum of the solar rays. So while in uh, orbit, we do not get exposed to, to the level that may result in serious issues on the surface of the moon. The situation is quite different. The impact that uh, can be sustained by the members of the lunar expeditions may not only result in a serious radiation impact, may also result in the death of cosmonauts and astronauts unless special measures are taken. The assessments made for the Apollo space craft and for the crew were showing that in case of um, major solar flares like in the August of 82, the protection of the thickness of 3 grams per square centimeters for a good uh, spacesuit may still exceed 500 rads which is 5 gray, and so this is the dose that uh, can be lethal for so much radiation exposure. Therefore, it is necessary to take all the measures aimed at the better understanding of uh, radiation exposure during lunar expedition, and uh, we are seeing a number of uh, factors uh, that uh, the moon is bombarded by the galactic radiation and uh, the solar rays. So it has a secondary level of uh, background radiation and uh, the neutron effect on biological objects shows uh, the specific effects since the coefficient of the biological results of the neutron flow may show several units and even for radiobiological effects effects sometimes show several tens of units. And if we take into account that um, for each proton falling on the surface of the moon, there is one high energy neutron, we will see how serious the factor of uh, secondary radiation impact is. And so special research 
needs to be performed in order to ensure safety from secondary radiation, taking into account the neutron flow. This radiation is particularly important during uh, the solar events when uh, proton powerful proton flows are generated. They are dangerous in themselves, but an additional danger factor is secondary radiation caused by those primary flows on all objects, uh, including the uh, lunar soil and the protective material of spacecraft and uh, spacesuits and uh, in uh, the tissues of uh, the humans. So this factor needs to be studied very carefully and uh, taken into account the analysis of uh, adverse impact by neutron at all the levels of biological systems from cellular to the overall organism system needs to be studied. A special role will be played by the process needed to employ a radiation safety system when you see strong flows of solar rays that are not mitigated by the geomagnetic field special measures need to be taken in order to avoid the adverse impact of such a radiation I'm hoping that our speakers will give us some more detailed information regarding those problems and the research as well as the result of the research in question. I would um, only say that this is a whole set of interrelated problems that need to be resolved in order to create what we call a system of radiation safety. This system is not uh, just uh, a single measure, but it's a whole set of measures, instruments, hardware, methods, and efforts that would enable, it, enable us to preclude the exceedance of um, the levels of radiation safety, which level is set by the norms developed on the basis of all the factors and all the outcomes. Evaluations of radiation hazard risk based on the outcomes and um, with the help of special measures that are built in the radiation safety measures when uh, the spacecraft is created so as uh, to ensure that we don't exceed the levels of um, radiation risk. The radiation risk is a measure that um, we take to evaluate for the safety of near-Earth uh, flights. The flights to the Moon and Mars would require that we modify this concept of risk. And the risk will determine the characteristics and levels of radiation hazard not only for the entire flight, but only even for the specific parts of the flight when we are looking at the specific radiation event at a stage of flight. So in order to evaluate the cumulative hazard, we will probably come to a different method, which is the damage assessment due to different risks factors expressed as um, reduction in uh, the life expectancy, subsequent life expectancy due to radiation impact. In order to figure out how we get to that point, we needed to develop a system that would include all the aspects uh, starting from the understanding of uh, the nature and the extent of radiation danger and uh, to the technical means uh, used to mitigate those uh, adverse impacts. The principles of such systems will not be dramatically different from the uh, principles aimed at ensuring safety from the standpoint of radiation both on Earth and in space. However, it would require certain specific features and measures which will necessarily be employed for the flights to the moon. The risk will be related not only uh, with the radio radiological and biological consequences, but also it will affect performance, the effectiveness of um, conducting the operations caused by um, impact of radiation, and it may result in difficulties and problematic aspects as uh, radiation impact 
impact itself. This is what we call ergonomic risk. Evaluation of this risk is um, related to such specialized research as radiation impact on performance on central nervous system, how the performance modifications can affect the potential uh, failure and the lethality to the crew and the activities under emergency situations. All of these issues need to be researched on the ground most thoroughly and only after it becomes clear and we have a specific picture of the results of the adverse impacts of radiation on regulatory systems, cellular elements and the organism as a whole, after we learn to lower the effects of those impacts by the internal and external factors, only then can we talk about the creating regulations and guidelines and methodological basis for ensuring radiation safety. In Russia at this time, we are doing some work that's oriented primarily to scientific and methodological basis for approach to resolving this problem as a whole. Specifically, we are planning a major experiment that would research the combined effect of uh, acute and um, cumulative radiation on the central nervous system and performance. So this is one of the steps that needs to be looked into during our research as to how to reduce the impact by introducing those norms and regulations. For the orbital flights, the first step was made in that area, and there is a constraint in terms of the radiation dose for acute impact, and uh, so these levels that mitigate the risk and uh, reduce uh, the uh, levels that can be achieved uh, from uh, the solar radiation are necessary to ensure safety. Unfortunately, this is a very small time allotted to me, and therefore I will not be able to go into detail, but I just wanted to give in brush, uh, large brush strokes uh, the ideas and the topics that we are discussing today. Therefore, we will discuss a whole myriad of aspects of radiation uh, issues. We will look at uh, uh, some other issues of lunar programs and the lunar soil, how to protect uh, the crew members uh, uh, and we are ready to talk about the development of international standards for space activities and space operations. I know that ICIP is uh, uh, working on drafting out these regulations. Therefore, today's forum uh, will, be, uh, will not bring the solutions today, but it will give us uh, ideas, it will give us inspiration to draft out maybe the major milestones that we need to cover in the future, uh, the standards that we need to develop, because it, this is inevitable that we need to think about these aspects for the future programs. And radiation always brings more harm than good, and we know that, and I believe that we can find the viable solutions, but only working together uh, on this myriad of issues, as I have mentioned today. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Petro. Um, I'm Marcelo Vázquez. I'm representing National Space Biomedical Research Institute, and I'm a co-moderator of this panel. And I think it was a wonderful introduction to our, our discussion this morning. And as you can see, we have an incredible uh, panel today in which uh, we'll be able to cover some of the key aspects of this unique risk uh, posed by solar particle event for lunar operations. It's a, it's a very timely uh, topic, and uh, that's one of the reasons we, we discuss this, because there is a consensus that solar particle event will pose certain risks for lunar operations in, in the next uh, few years when we come back to the moon. So uh, I would like uh, the rules of engagement for this morning is that each of the participants will have 10 minutes. I will tell you when is one minute is left just to start wrap up your presentation. After each presentation, we will have time for a couple of questions, no more. And we will try to finish with all the, the presenters. And after, uh, if we have time, we will open the, f the, the floor for open questions and discussions on the topics. As you can see from the names of the panel and the topics, we want to cover, um, a, cover uh, a, a broad spectra of key issues related to solar particle and lunar operations. We want to know first, what is the, uh, uh, the space agency's position or regulation of standards 
uh, uh, confronting this risk and what are the plans to approach the research and uh, fill the gaps on this area. So we are very glad that Professor Petrov is chairing this uh, panel and with a wonderful introduction. And also we have uh, Dr. Francis Cucinata and Oliver Angiver from ESA and Francis from ESA and I would li NASA and I would like to if you each of you make a very short uh, description of who are you who are representing and before you, you speak. So I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Francis Cucinota, please, Francis, if you can uh, start your, your speech, please. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Marcelo and uh, Dr. Petrov, Laszlov. Um, so we're focusing today on the solar particle event issue, and uh, but just to give you, I'm the chief scientist for the NASA Space Radiation Program. So NASA has a fairly large program looking at the four main categories of risks. Uh, these would be cancer, uh, degenerative risk, which would be risk to the heart, and cataracts, and some other ones that are just being explored. Uh, also, um, acute risk, and then risk to the central nervous system. But today, we're, the solar particle event problem um, is an interesting one. It's one that's probably overstated in a lot of ways, and that because, of, in fact, if you look through the history of solar particle events, there's been 370 events since the, they've been tracked in the modern space area since 1955. So typically in a year, there's five to 10 solar particle events, but now each event is different. They're, they're sort of like snowflakes, uh, and the differences are related to the size, how many particles come, also the energies of the particles, and the energies are very important because that determines what the doses would be to the critical organs, and then there's also the rise time. So the rise time is very important for operations because some events rise very slowly, so you have time to react, and some events arise uh, very quickly, so you have very little time to react. So the, and now the biggest problem is going to be mission disruption. That most of these events have no health consequences. Uh, in fact, on the space station, they're actually beneficial because it's connected to the galactic cosmic rays, where the more solar um, activity you have, the lower the background radiation for galactic cosmic rays will be. We've, we've shown this over and over again. It's called a, a forbish decrease, and it actually lowers the exposure on the space station when you have a solar particle event, because the energies aren't high enough to penetrate inside the vehicle. But you will have this small number of uh, events, 5% inside a vehicle, and maybe as 10% of the events during EVA on lunar surface or in deep space that would have health consequences. So the, the biggest challenge will be operationally, there'll be a much larger number of events which will disrupt the mission, and the, the basic problem will be what, where's the event going to go? Is it going to go to a, one of these smaller number of bigger ones, or is it going to be a small event with a very uh, shallow dose and uh, nothing really to worry about? But at this present time, we don't, no one knows how to tell that, tell the difference between a large one or a small one until about four hours into the event. Now, there are some newer methods with electron detectors that seem to have a capability not only to predict that an event has started ahead of the arrival of the solar protons, and remember now, when we're talking about crew health risks, it's the protons that do the damage, not the x-ray flares, and there's many more x-ray flares than there will be proton events, and, and there, there's some correlation between x-rays and protons, but it's not a perfect correlation. But there, are some, there is some new information that electrons detection uh, occurs, um, gives you a warning of anywhere from 10 minutes to one to two hours before the arrival of protons, and there's some information that the electron also will gauge the size of the proton events, so that, that's some new information, but presently, we really don't have a good feel for where the event's going to go. So that means during mission operations, you're going to have to respond that this could be a big event. And so it, especially during an EVA on the lunar surface, which will be many man hours or human hours of EVAs, perhaps 10% uh, of the mission timeline on on the lunar surface, you will be doing EVAs. This is going to be quite a big of a problem. Now, the, the health risk would be largely cancer and acute risk. The cancer risk is the major problem for solar particle events, and this is because of the, the dose rate effects is going to prevent most of the acute risk from happening. And also, acute risks are uh, risks that occur above a threshold. For example, death is, there is no solar particle event that we know of that would cause early death. Uh, you'd have to be outside with no shielding for the whole event to get to that regime of doses. And this has been overstated in the literature, and the, the basic reason is solar physicists are not really uh, apprised of radiobiology, so the three mistakes they often make is the energies of the protons, they don't penetrate into the or internal organs. There's also 
the heterogeneity of the doses that for the acute death, which is, occurs for a depletion of bone marrow cells, there'll be regions of the body that get very small doses. And this, these regions, as long as it's 5% of your marrow, they will protect the whole body from acute death. So you, you will have regions in the body that are very well shielded in the marrow system and other regions that are uh, narrowly shielded. So the, the, but, that, that will, but those reasons and also the dose rate effect, which is very sparing, meaning the risk are lower uh, during a chronic exposure to a solar particle event. So this, is, this would be the third category why it's been overstated by solar physicists that most of these events occur over several hours or several days, so they're not an acute exposure at all. Now, there is other acute risks, the prodromal risks, which are nausea, vomiting, um, and uh, fatigue, anorexia, some of these things. These are more likely, and during the EVA, if you don't have a quick response time, they will be possible. But overall, the cancer risk is the one that's going to be the, the most problematic, the and especially if you, if we, we break out cancer into two broad categories of solid cancers and liquid cancers, and liquid cancers would be leukemias and lymphomas. These risks are, have very strong dose rate modifiers, and especially the leukemia risk will be the one that would be the most troubling for solar particle events because it works opposite to the acute risk. These regions of the marrow that get very high doses are going to be, the, be very problematic for your leukemia risk and the, the regions. So in the acute risk, it's the other way around. The regions that, of the marrow that get very small doses are going to protect the whole body, but the leukemia risk and lymphoma risk will be uh, more dramatic during a solar particle event. Um, the other aspects of, of this problem is shielding the present launch capabilities uh, prevent uh, launching of large masses into space. The energy spectrum of the proton events, we, we have very good data on a couple hundred events. I said there was 370 that we know about. Not all of them do you have very uh, good information on, on the energy spectrum, but from, from the ones we do know, we know uh, we have a very good feeling for how much shielding would be needed uh, to protect someone from a solar particle event. It's not an enormous amount of shielding. It's quite a manageable problem, but it's a costly problem. It's, it's not like the galactic cosmic rays where the energies are so penetrating, you really can never shield them out, uh, but it, it will take about um, five to ten centimeters of a, a water equivalent uh, material to shield against these solar particle events. So you don't need to bury yourself in regolith, but you need, do need to have the capability to have this additional shielding in localized places of either a spacecraft or on the lunar surface to, to really reduce the risk. The, the um, importance of dosimetry can't be uh, uh, overstated. Uh, dosimetry will be the, the major uh, way to protect yourself from solar particle events, and this would be real-time dosimetry, which will, with uh, redundancy, the redundancy would include s redundant systems, but also redundant uh, 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 processors of the information. This would be the astronauts themselves would have to have self-alert, but also mission control uh, in, in international countries would also have to participate in alerting the astronaut that an event has started. Um, the a LARA problem is also there, that uh, a lot of these events are below what's accept acceptable, but you still want to reduce the exposures uh, further. Uh, from the research side, we're also pursuing countermeasures research in the, the NASA Space Radiation Program. And this becomes a problem also because we're looking at a multitude of risks. So the, the risk of uh, acute effects Will, would pro possibly take one type of countermeasure, and the risk of uh, a cancer would probably take a different type of countermeasure. So there could be some antagonistic relationships between uh, countermeasures for one risk and another that will have to be studied and uh, looked at operationally. There, there also is the possibility that risk from a countermeasure for proton events would be different from heavy ions in the galactic cosmic rays. And one of the things we're interested in is that for uh, acute risk, preventing uh, apoptosis or cell death is very important uh, attribute of a countermeasure. But it looks like for heavy ions, you actually want to promote apoptosis, that you'd want cells that have been damaged by heavy ions to actually be killed off. So you have this antagonistic relationship, not only between the risk, but also potentially between the types of radiation an astronaut would be exposed to. So this, this is another problem which is going to be an enormous challenge for <coughs> research programs. Um, the cost can't be understated that if you don't have good knowledge that most of these events are actually duds, they're going to be uh, very small doses, but how to manage that problem, you're going to drive your cost up. 
The other thing is the, the risk acceptable, less levels of risk acceptance. The, for acute risk, we accept no risk. Um, but for cancer risk right now, we have a 3% absolute risk. We've changed this recently within NASA from <coughs> looking at 3% excess risk to a 3% absolute risk. And this is important because some people uh, discuss that the excess risk is the same as background cancers in a general population, but actually radiation-induced cancers are different than background cancers. There's a different spectrum of cancers occur, but also, more, more importantly, the detriment is higher that we're talking about. One minute, Francis. Uh, much higher, I'm almost done. Most higher, much higher levels of life loss from a radiation-induced cancer than a background <clears throat> cancer in the general population. So right now it's estimated at uh, a 15-year life loss for, for an exposure at age 40 if someone would go on to uh, die from a, a radiation exposure. There's also radiation uh, cancer incidence, which would gauge at about uh, close to twice as high as the cancer mortality risk for the same exposure. But also there's the non-cancer risks, which are not stochastic in nature, but uh, deterministic in, in nature. So uh, for some people discuss raising the cancer risk limit to 5% or 10%, for some arbitrary number, to avoid these problems of having exposure limits, which, requ which lead to requirements on timelines and shielding. But the problem becomes cancer. There's, there's really no difference that we know about between cancer risk at 1% uh, risk or 3%. It's really the same detriment to the person but the non-cancer risk will occur at thresh above thresholds, but also the detriment is to believed to increase with the dose of the, the radiation. So, for example, the one thing we're, one type of risk we're worried about is heart disease. We are only not only do we think there's a, a threshold for that risk, but we also think that the detriment for these non-cancer risks would be increasing with the dose. So, the risk from for heart disease and some of these degenerative risks that would occur at low doses would be different at high doses. There would be either earlier latencies or more aggressive types of disease. So this uh, makes us pause when we hear people discussing l raising the cancer risk levels because we think you're actually in a non-linear situation where you're going to go from just being worried about cancer risk to now be worrying about a host of disease diseases related to aging and not only the probability of these risks being different but also the detriment from the risk being higher. Thank you. We have uh, time for one question from the audience. Please. My, my question relates to uh, the, the issues relating to dietary factors for which there is evidence um, of uh, altering the response of cells to radiation and also themselves uh, when suboptimal inducing DNA damage levels to extent similar to as seen with low dose radiation. To what degree do you think um, but further research needs to be done in this area. Yeah, so this is, there's, a, there's a lot of research needed. Uh, first, the, um, for example, leukemia risk is believed to be an additive risk, so the, the dietary factors might not be that important, but solid cancer risk, the preferred model is multiplicative, so the dietary factors might be uh, quite important there. Uh, there's also the, the, the fact that to be used operationally, you need to have a quantitative measure of, of the benefit from these things, but also some of the other issues I alluded to that, uh, do you have a, something where it works at high doses but not low doses. It works for protons but not heavy ions. And actually, there's some new studies that were published in the Journal of America, uh, JAMA, the German American Medical Association, that some, if the dietary factors are taken as supplements, it actually can be detrimental compared to a, as a food, part of your food uh, intake. So there's a lot of open questions, not only about which are the best dietary factors, uh, are they always good for you, and then also quantity quantifying the, the benefits, because uh, to be used operationally, there'll be much more benefit to NASA and other space agencies if you can give a number on what the actual benefit would be from these factors. Thank you. I think this uh, topic will return at the end of the session in terms of countermeasures. Okay, so I would like to continue. I would like to invite Olivier Anguirier to give us the European Space Agency perspective at this point. Good morning, everybody, and thanks to the organizers and the panel chairman for inviting me to this interesting summit. Um, my name is Oliver Angre. As uh, Marcelo mentioned, I'm working for the European Space Agency in the Human Spaceflight Directorate as uh, Human Exploration Science Coordinator. 
And in that function, I'm dealing with a variety of different uh, subjects, uh, scientific subjects, which uh, for this panel includes the head of dealing with the uh, new radiation biology activities that we are starting up at ESA. Now, in this illustrious round, I feel like the tiny baby brother, kind of, because we are really just uh, on our first steps in uh, creating these kind of new activities. And uh, in, in that sense, I couldn't even attempt to, to add much new information to what Francis already said about uh, the solar particles events themselves and the risks derived from them. But I think my role in this panel in any case is a bit more to give you a brief update on what is happening in Europe at the moment, so what kind of new uh, possibilities also for cooperation are <coughs> developing. Basically, there is a history in radiation activities in Europe which is ma mainly focused on some dosimetry and exposure experiments, but not a lot going on when it comes to the human-related uh, issues and especially biological research in order to later on then improve risk assessments. This is something that only started in the last few years. Basically, in 2001, we uh, got approved a new program, the Aurora program, uh, that was focusing on exploration. And that was really a major change for the agency in the sense that before that, the perspective for human spaceflight was the International Space Station and not going beyond that. So with the Aurora program, for the first time, this view changed and the, these kind of exploration preparation issues be, became much more relevant. In this context, uh, radiation, of course, was in, identified as one of the uh, big risk factors where additional information is needed. And that's why uh, we, we spent a few years then preparing a new program that is specifically looking at radiation biology. Um, we, we are trying to put something together similar to what Frank and our NASA colleagues are, are doing in Brookhaven, using ground-based accelerators for biological research. And actually, right at the moment, this, this summit is just a couple of days too early, because right at the moment, we have a research announcement open for these issues. Um, and the, the deadline of this research announcement is Monday, so if it would have been a few days later, I could have given you exact numbers on the response. But uh, we are, with this research announcement, we are taking the first steps in trying to create and to condense a scientific community in this interesting field uh, in, in Europe. Now, from the letters of intent that we've received uh, a couple of months ago, we already have a very good indication that there's a lot of interest out there, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the proposals. Now, at the European Space Agency, we don't have a very clear mandate or a clearly defined role of for, for lunar exploration at the moment. Uh, there, there was planning in the beginning of the Aurora program of a coherent strategy that was leading along various steps to then in the future putting human beings on Mars. And the moon was, of course, one of the stepping stones in the process. But uh, the strategy also has become a bit diluted and uh, is not the, the primary guideline with all the uh, structural changes that have been happening to the program. So at the moment, it's not very clear. We, we don't have that operational uh, drive and uh, commitment and mandate uh, to support these kind of missions. Uh, and that is why the kind of research and, and activities that we intend to do are not that focused. So we, we will not have activities that are specifically looking at solar particle events on the lunar surface and the efforts of improving the risk assessments of, of these. Um, however, in the research announcement, for example, we have uh, mentioned a number of different topics that are, of course, of relevance, and those are broadly in four categories. The first one is long-term effects of, of space radiation. The other one is acute effects of space radiation. 
The third one is uh, combined effects of space radiation and the microgravity or change gravity field. And the final one is countermeasures against space radiation. And from these topics, you see that, of course, there are a lot of uh, fields where there's overlap or synergy also for the question of uh, solar particle events on the lunar surface. So, like I said, the, the deadline is on Monday, and we'll see what proposals we get in then addressing these different issues. Um, basically, with this, I, I would finish and say then concluding that at the moment, for me, the main contribution uh, from our side, or what I, what I hope to be able to do, is to contribute a little bit with the fundamental research aspect to improving the operational considerations that are related to solar particle events on the lunar surface. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Oliver. Just time for a couple of questions for Olivier, if you're interested. I have a comment, Olivier. So just comparing uh, present and future activities in terms of uh, NASA, American, European, the NASA is really tied to operational related needs and timelines. So in your case, it's a little more flexible, I guess. That's, that's the case? Exactly. That, that's definitely the case. For, for the moment, we, as a first step, like I say, we, we are just creating this new community at the moment. So we are very open. We are really more on the fundamental level, level of uh, research. And then when it becomes clearer also to which degree and in which form uh, ESA or, or Europe generally would be uh, a part of lunar exploration or other exploration scenarios, then this hopefully would, be, would become more focused. Uh, you ambition collaboration. I'm sorry, uh, Professor. One short question. One brief question. What radiobiological investigation do you plan for developing the some foundation for limitation radiation exposure during the Moon and Mars mission? Um, at the moment, I, I cannot give you a concrete answer to this because, like I said, the, the research announcement is, is open. It, it is clearly stated that countermeasures, for example, are addressed. But in the end, we will depend on what kind of proposals are coming in in response to this research announcement uh, in order to can say something about which countermeasures are specifically looked at. I know that there are some, there, there's some interest on nutritional supplements or some pharmacological agents. Um, also on the physics side, there's some uh, interest in, in proposing some shielding uh, experiments, but uh, well, we need to wait for what proposals actually come in. Then. Thank you very much. Since we are talking about uh, a very need of ba basic research, and because we have still several gaps, not only for acute, for also for late effects, it's mostly late effects. I would like to invite Amy Cronenberg just to address some of the um, gaps in the biology knowledge and what are the research needs for acute effects and other risk. Thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be here. It's a tall order in 10 minutes to tell you what I think the research gaps are. But first, I'd like to start by stating the problem a little bit differently. And with uh, apologies to Professor Petroff, because I missed the very beginning of your uh, discussion. If I'm repeating something you've already said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, can, I can repeat. <laughs> the, For you special. the question, uh, as I see it, with regard to solar particle events, which is what we were supposed to focus on first, is the idea that uh, this type of exposure itself represents a complex radiation field. All radiations in space, for those of you who don't think about this every day, are not equal. They have very uh, different properties with regard to the energy of the incident radiation type, the charge of that radiation type. Mostly we're talking here about charged particle radiations, although there are other radiations in space radiation environments, but we're talking about the charged particle environments. And in solar particle events, uh, not only do they vary in uh, 
in total number of incident particles, but the distribution of those particles changes from event to event. Most are protons. There are some that are heavier. There are alpha particles in some solar particle events that need to be considered as well. Um, in some rare events, and at very small numbers, you even can see some of the higher Z elements uh, showing up, but at very small numbers. So it's, it's difficult as a radiobiologist to think of all of these types of events as equal, because they're not. The energy of a proton will dictate how far it penetrates into a biological material. And so there uh, are a lot of questions there with regard still to our understanding of the radiobiological effectiveness of protons as a function of proton energy and also as a function of the dose rate. So the international uh, community uh, through the ICRP, the International Committee on Radiation Protection, and also the National Council on Radiation Protection, which is the U.S. body, uh, are currently using somewhat, I think, still arbitrarily and with uncertainty around the number, a value of two to compare uh, the effectiveness of protons, independent of proton energy, against the standard reference radiation like gamma rays, about which we know a lot more. And I think there's still a fair bit of uncertainty about that number of two that's used for estimating proton risks. It's probably a conservative number in most cases, based on what we know now from the human exposure experience, because people are being treated more and more around the world with protons for therapy for cancer. So there's more information that is available now uh, from human exposed populations, but bear in mind those are usually partial body exposures to limited areas. But some information should be uh, gathered from those uh, human uh, clinical uh, experiences to improve the risk estimates. So that's one area I think is important. Another area is the, the concept of the dose and dose rate effectiveness factor for protons. So this is a concept that has developed largely again from uh, experimental studies with other kinds of sparsely ionizing radiation, primarily gamma rays and x-rays. If you drop the doses so the dose is very low, or if you uh, provide a wider time interval over which the dose is given, you can modify biological response in many, but not all cases. And so I think there's still a question out there about how to think about this dose and dose rate effectiveness factor, particularly with regard to protons. And in the case of solar particle events, many of them would fall under this category that we think of as low dose rate, for which this DDREF, as they call it, dose, dose rate effectiveness factor, it's very bad uh, jargon, sorry, uh, is applied. But there are, uh, there have been solar particle events, not most of them, but some of them, where this concept may not apply. The dose rate is too high, but it's not an acute dose rate either. And so these are areas where I think, uh, and it's not just me, uh, much larger group of radiobiologists than me who have contributed both to the recent uh, NCRP report 153 that was issued in the end of 2006 and an upcoming report from the National Academy have considered these uh, issues as areas that are very important for investigation. So this would obtain both with regard to acute effects as uh, w was mentioned by Francis, but also with regard to estimating cancer risk. And I bring that up because there's some evidence that one of the endpoints that's used as a uh, predictor for cancer risk, which is chromosomal aberrations, has been shown to have a dose rate effectiveness factor for protons in work that came actually out of JSC. Uh, but uh, how that applies over the broader uh, case of the limits, both with respect to proton energy and possible dose rates for the worst case SPE, I think is still out there to be determined. So very quickly now, I'll touch on a couple of other, other 
areas of gaps that I think are important. Uh, because of cost and also a complexity of experiments, and also the development of new models, I think it's quite important to consider the use of more realistic biological models for estimating radiation risks. And by that I say, and I'm guilty of this as much as anyone, what you do on a, on a Petri dish with a flat, uh, uncomplicated single type of cell may not be a very good predictor of the risks to an organism. And there have been developments in three-dimensional tissue cultures and in uh, tissue equivalent models that I think will provide a much better, a more realistic estimation of the complex responses of biological systems. Some of that work will have to also be done in animals. But you can start to make the, you can start to bridge this gap and uh, make more productive use of the animal experiments, I think, by going to these more complex organoid systems for evaluating radiation effects. And I think that will be very uh, useful and important to do. Now, with regard to the prodromal effects, I know that the NSBRI has a call out now. I believe the proposals are all in at this yes. point. Correct. And the call for that uh, work was specifically to address the issues related to the prodromal effects of solar particle radiations. But I would point out as well that there are uh, effects to be considered beyond the effects related to nausea and vomiting, including in some cases, particularly for intermediate dose rates, uh, consideration of the risk for skin damage, mm -hmm. as well as the issue of leukemogenesis. And I come back to that because uh, many of the studies that have been done to date in the area of leukemogenesis have been done at dose rates during which the normal process of hematopoiesis is perturbed. So the dynamics uh, may not have been addressed at ranges where hemopoiesis is maintained in its normal uh, context. And so I still think that that may be an area that uh, will require some additional work. Our understanding, as Francis mentioned, of the issues related to what some people have called deterministic effects in other tissues in the past, which I'm not sure are deterministic effects anymore. And the tissues I mentioned, again, again would be lens, uh, the cardiovascular system, for which there's evidence of radiation uh, effects from the atomic bomb survivors at doses of less than 50 millisieverts, uh, approximately 50 millisieverts. We don't know very much about lower doses. I think those are areas, again, where uh, we don't know what we may need to know, and the issue of exposure at low doses uh, having consequences, uh, I think, may come back to us again. And last but not least, um, I know the favorite area for some at this table is neurological damage, and I would like to point out that the issue there is damage that may affect uh, the ability for stem cell repopulation in the hippocampus. And by extension to that, I'd also like to move over to the hematopoietic stem cell uh, system, which has been shown to be acutely radiation sensitive in some recent work that's come out of the uh, University of Pennsylvania in Brookhaven. And so I think our understanding of radiation effects on stem cells in general um, has a lot to be desired. So with that, going back one more time to the issue of behavioral effects, I think that uh, on the basis of our understanding of the progenitor cell sensitivity, stem and progenitor cell sensitivity, I think we have a lot to learn yet about performance deficits and changes in behavior and aging-related effects in the CNS. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, one comment, uh, Amy just mentioned a few minutes ago that NSVRI is a release uh, a call for uh, acute, uh, radiation, uh, acute effect radiation, uh, center of radiation research. And we are attacking uh, uh, not only prodromal syndrome, but also skin damage oh. is included in, in the, the request and also some hematological changes are part of the aims of the, the project. Yeah. Well, uh, question, Professor Petro. Have you some special project for investigation, the reparation process on the various level of organization of matter for cellular? Tissue. Yes, thank you for asking yeah, that yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Very there important are, for estimation of the hazard of solar cosmic rays. Well, we haven't 
uh, we, we need to move this into the issue of solar events. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, s several investigators at my institution and at several other institutions, including Columbia University, for example, that are asking across the different levels of organization, from isolated cells and culture to organoid systems or three-dimensional systems to animal models, how you extrapolate risk. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry to say that the experiments are in progress, or I should say I'm pleased to say the experiments are in progress, but we don't have all the answers yet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, NASA, the NASA research program is investing about uh, $15 million a year just on that question that you asked. So we have many investigations in that area. Okay. The radiological consequences of exposure. Yes. But the repair yes. process. Is taken into account the quality of radiation. Yes. yes? Okay. But, but also, in in these, these new modern approaches where you not only look at molecules of cells, but you look across tissue organization to the, the endpoint in whole animals. Thank you. We have time for uh, one short question. Please, Neil. Kernberg, I, I, you're talking about the, the dose rate effects before. It reminded me of something from chemical carcinogenesis. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some ignorance here. So please bear with me. But, in uh, the uh, observations that you have, is there anything you can derive regarding uh, the difference between a constant low uh, dose rate exposure like you see in GCR uh, versus what you see in episodics? And when you look at episodics like SPEs, is there anything that you can tell us about the relationship okay, between so the episode and the elapsed time between and how many episodes and that kind of thing? The answer is no. So there's a, a, a large question out there, I think, with regard to if you're alluding to something called adaptive responses. That's right. For example, okay. Um, an adaptive response for radiation exposure was discovered in the 1970s, I believe, uh, for lymphocytes uh, by Shelley Wolf. And the conundrum has been there ever since because not all individuals, lymphocytes, adapt, period. Uh, in the experiments that were done at that time, there was a time interval between the initial low dose exposure and the challenge dose, which was a high dose exposure, during which you could actually see evidence of reducing the effect of that high dose exposure. The window was limited, this window for adaptation was limited in this very episodic approach to somewhere between a couple of hours up to a maximum of about 24 hours. So if you uh, consider that as a paradigm for space flight, I think that's a tough one. Um, the issue of chronic low-dose exposure reducing, or, or maybe not, maybe enhancing, <coughs> the effect of a second challenge, uh, even of the same radiation quality, has not been studied very well. And what I didn't say earlier is that we have to think about space ex radiation exposures as being punctuations on a continuum. Because you have, you're going to still have on the surface of the moon the GCR exposure, which will be there, which has protons and heavier elements. At Low, uh, free, low frequencies, but they'll be there. And then you have on top of that this issue of the, of the SPE. And so from a temporal standpoint, this is a very hard thing to model. And I think the experiments just have to be done. So the program now is supporting experiments on combined exposures to protons and heavier ions. Um, and the development now of a solar simulator at the uh, NASA Space Radiation Laboratories in New York, which will uh, permit long-term low-dose rate exposures to uh, things that simulate the solar spectrum. And you choose, you choose which solar spectrum you want. But most of it's going to be very low energy. Uh, those are the experiments that we need to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Ivan. So I would like to make a, a dramatic change of perspective now. So we learn about our biological gaps, what are the, some of the standards, or what are the, the predicted worst case scenarios. But I would like to see what it's like to, to be in a, during a solar particle event. So I want to have that, that perspective. 
And after that, we'll see what we can do now in terms of monitor and what are the future perspectives in dealing with a solar particle on the moon. But I would like to uh, give the floor to Lerocha, and I think you have some experience on that. I would like to see the astronaut perspective of how it looks like to, to leave one of the solar particle events. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Well, first of all, uh, good morning. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you to our co-chairs, Dr. Alfred, Mr. Abbey, and also Dr. Petrov and Dr. Vasquez. Um, well, my name is Leroy Chow, and I've spent 15 years at NASA as an astronaut. And during those 15 years, I had a good, good opportunity to fly on four missions. During my first 10 years, uh, I was flying on shuttle missions. And so, frankly, we didn't really think much about space radiation. It was something that was out there. We knew that we got a higher dose when we went into space. But uh, it was not something that we really thought that much about, it, about because we really couldn't do much about it. And uh, we were focused more on the acute risks of, of course, very much concerned about the launch phase and the entry phase of our flights. Uh, once I finished flying uh, shuttles and I got assigned to the Expedition Corps, started training for a long-duration space flight, which turned into a six-and-a-half-month mission aboard uh, the International Space Station. Uh, I found myself thinking more about the, the radiation risks because, of course, you still have the acute risks of flying uh, during uh, launch phase and during the entry phase and uh, other, other uh, uh, times during the mission of acute risk, higher acute <coughs> risk, like during EVA or during uh, rendezvous and docking. But uh, what do you do about this six-and-a-half-month exposure about, uh, to, to radiation? Um, I had learned after uh, training and living in Russia for quite a while that uh, red wine is apparently, uh, in Russia anyway, a, uh, an effective countermeasure to radiation. However, in, in the absence of red wine aboard the uh, International Space Station, uh, what they instead packed for me was a, a large Ziploc bag full of these big green vitamins and uh, told me to take one each day. And, and I remember every day, every morning, taking this vitamin. And no matter how much coffee or water you drank, it's still kind of just crept its way down over the hours, uh, down into your stomach. Um, but, you know, again, it wasn't something we really could do much about, and that was about the, uh, the extent of my uh, anti-radiation countermeasure. We did have a solar particle event, and that was an interesting radio call to receive from the ground, telling us that during these certain times, during parts of the orbit, we were to retreat to the more heavily uh, shielded areas of the station. And uh, I have to tell you, it was a, a very helpless feeling because this was something uh, that was occurring, uh, and the best thing we could do is retreat into our, uh, you know, the safer areas. Um, we had to do this over several orbits, and even in the days following the events, we would look at the radiation monitors, and, and I would note that the levels that were being measured were 10 times higher than the normal, and uh, it makes you stop and think about, well, what does this mean down the road? So it's, it's part of the risk that we ex accept as, uh, as astronauts and cosmonauts and as uh, space explorers, uh, but it is a problem that's on our mind, especially as we start talking about longer missions in space, missions to the moon, to live on the moon in moon bases, and uh, ultimately in the near, near to midterm anyway, a, a manned mission to Mars, uh, where you're very far away from, uh, from the protections of the, the Van Allen belt. So, uh, I think this is a timely topic, and uh, I'm very interested from a crew perspective, as are all astronauts who are training for, for longer duration flights. Thank you. Thank you, Leroy. Can, can you be a little, uh, a little specific in terms, how was it in terms of uh, the operational rules and when you find it, what, what you exactly did, what are kind of the, the process that you went through just to follow instruction for mission control and so forth. Yeah, sure. Actually, it was very simple. Uh, we got called up, uh, said, okay, you're, there's a solar particle event is happening, and during these parts of the orbit, your the spacecraft will be exposed to uh, to the event, the results of the event. So during this time, from this mission time to this mission time, uh, you two are to retreat to the more heavily shielded parts of the station. So for me, that meant uh, going to the uh, the U.S. lab in the tests. Uh, we have some panels inside of the the sleep station there that uh, are you know have a little bit more shielding. Salajan was to stay in the middle of the uh, service module, the Russian service module, where there was more uh, equipment around that part, so a little bit more metal to to uh, shield him a little more. Um, and that was it, really. And then we were supposed to just keep track of it on our clocks and, and come out at the appropriate times, and we could continue working and then uh, set our alarms to uh, notify us to go back during uh, the next period. And this happened over over the course of uh, several orbits, you know, until the, um, the radiation had passed. Uh, Eddie, you want to contribute to this at this point? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Um, the uh, kind of fortuitous... Um, 
Leroy. Leroy was uh, in Expedition 10, and the event in which he was exposed to was the January 20th, 2005 solar particle event. And what's unique about that particular event is, uh, as Frank alluded to, uh, this was an extremely fast uh, onset of an event. We normally get an, uh, uh, an X-ray signature followed by some larger period of time where we see particles due to either a flare or a CME that was seen uh, uh, on the surface of the sun. But in this event, we saw X-rays, uh, uh, very intense soft X-rays, followed by particles, energetic particles, greater than 100 MeV uh, in about 10 minutes. So it was, uh, and still studied, it's a very uh, well-known event and yeah, space physicists are studying that event and understand the, understanding the acceleration phenomena that caused the rapid onset of these, uh, these particles. This is one that people like to highlight when they talk about lunar operations because we had no warning. There was no forecast uh, available for that day to say, uh, look out for a large event. This came completely un, uh, uh, unknown and, su and surprised both the space weather community and uh, uh, the operations group, us. So luckily on ISS, you know, with the, the shielding and the orbit, orbital phasing, the doses that uh, Leroy received was, was minimal. Um, and, uh, but it's something to consider when we do leave the geomagnetic protection of Earth and, and how we would deal with such an event. Uh, even though may, if the intensities were not life-threatening, how it may impact emissions. So it was very interesting that you end up being our panel member and you were <laughs> just lucky, witnessing I guess. the fastest <laughs> event on record, actually. Well, the probability of that. <laughs> I want to note that uh, Dave Williams is here and Dave and I, mostly Dave, were the ones that got the tests shielded. And so I, I always appreciate Dave because it's the radiation people have these ideas, but you really need a, a good manager to go around selling the idea and get it implemented. Yeah, thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, David, David, you want to comment or uh, on this? You know, I think this is a, a really critical area. We're going to touch on this tomorrow on the Space Medicine panel as well, particularly with regard to the long-term consequences of radiation exposure. And typically, we think of the risk of spaceflight as ending when your wheels stop, you know, and you're out of the vehicle. But I think biologically, this is one of the very critical areas that we need to look at particularly for the future. Leroy, I did have a question for you, though. You know the flashes that you see periodically. Did you have any biological consequences? Did you notice anything during the period? You know, it's interesting. During my first shuttle mission, uh, I did notice the retinal flashes. You know, it was a two-week space lab mission, and I noted several flashes, especially, you know, in the first few hours in space. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in fact, Don Thomas, who's here, uh, he and I flew together on that mission, and we both talked about the retinal flashes. And then, uh, I don't know if, if you just kind of get used to them and forget about them, uh, and then don't notice them anymore, but uh, on my future missions, I really didn't note many retinal flashes, and uh, on the, the station mission, um, you know, I recall a couple, but I, I, don't, I don't really recall that many, and I don't know if you're just busy working and you, and you don't really notice them anymore, you get used to them. Yeah, I think it, uh, currently in the International Space Station is an Italian experiment called Altea and Alteino. They are measuring uh, light flashes phenomenon and, and try to correlate with physiological parameters. And one thing they note is that in tremendous variability between individuals, like between astronauts and cosmonauts, and it's very difficult to, to match and correlate on that. But the still the, the phenomenon and what exactly means in terms of a human health is still out there. Uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. I have a wonderful story from the Apollo program on on. But uh, we don't know exactly what exactly it means. Apparently, it's just a phenomenon. But what exactly it means in terms of brain damage or retinal is out there, yeah. Okay. Leroy. One last question. Bye. Uh, Petro. Leroy. How you estimate the psychological effect of information about solar flare? During the flight, <laughs> well, I, I think most uh, most the personal estimation. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, uh, all astronauts and cosmonauts, we want to receive as much information as possible, good or bad. And so, uh, we appreciated the the prompt radio calls and kind of the discussion about what what to expect and what was happening. Of course, we didn't feel anything. We just had plenty of time to to sit in our shielded areas and think about what was happening. So, uh, psychologically, yeah, I mean, during the during the event, it was well, gosh, I wonder how much radiation I'm getting and what this really means down the road um, but at the same time it was a, it was really a feeling of helplessness there was nothing more we could do uh, but just sit there and uh, take it uh, okay so. one, one oh, thank you thank you one comment uh, or question basically have you been uh, debrief or before your mission or as a, as a part of the standard protocol in terms of simulate a solar particle a, a solar particle event uh, 
procedures? Uh, have you briefed in full the consequences? Or what is it? Well, I mean, yes, that? we did receive briefings on radiation, of course, as part of our, our medical ops. And uh, uh, we knew the procedure was to retreat to these more heavily shielded areas of the station. Uh, also, of course, the, the, uh, the vitamins that were supplied to, uh, you know, hopefully being a countermeasure to uh, some of the radiation. Um, but Really, there was not much more to say. It was, you know, that's that's about all we could do. And so it's just uh, the probability was low. Uh, you know, there could be a solar event, but most likely the energies would not be uh, something that should be a factor. But, um, you know, so we really didn't dwell on it much, very well, very much. Well, thank you very much. I think we need to uh, continue with our with the next speaker. And I think it's absolutely related with this in, in terms of what are the present uh, protocols and, and procedures in terms of use space weather assets just to see what's coming up and what are the capability to predict and manage those rigs. And I'd like to invite Eddie Simonis from the Space Radiation Analysis Group to, to comment on that. Thank you, Marcelo. So yes, uh, kind of a good introduction for uh, SPE forecasting. I'm gonna talk a little bit just briefly about um, operational aspects of SPE forecasting. Um, utilizing forecasts. We're not in the game of, uh, of forecasting per se. We have a strong relationship with the Space Weather Prediction Center operated by NOAA of the National Weather Service. Um, we're lucky that um, through the Space Shuttle Program and ISS Program, we've maintained a, an operational team that, that uh, has gotten to practice and learn about uh, solar particle event forecasting and uh, how to handle those SPEs um, in real time. And uh, into in the international flavor of this meeting, this is a, a, a follow-on to what to Leroy's um, mission is that those recommendations to seek shelter uh, during specific times were are coordinated by our group, the Space Radiation Analysis Group, and the Russian Radiation Safety Group, um, and we we have a real good working relationship and share information about trajectories, uh, estimate estimates of. Uh, potential doses to be received, and we have a joint, um, we got to go forward to the flight management team with a joint um, decision about informing the crew. So hopefully in, in exploration kind of activities, we can continue those types of um, collaborations. Um, in general, SPE forecasting is, uh, can be likened to terrestrial uh, forecasting. Uh, there's three broad categories uh, of forecasting. That is uh, number one, long lead time forecasts, such like what's the weather going to be like over the next week uh, to 10 days or, or you know, th those types of time durations. We have short term forecasts. You know, what's the weather going to be like today? Is it sunny or is it rainy? You know, how bad is today going to be? Those are our short term forecasts or short term warnings we like to talk about. And then we have what uh, can be referred to as now casting or alerts when there, an event has been detected and um, how quickly we can get the event detection information to the flight team and to the crew. A little bit different than if you think about terrestrial weather is, uh, or, or maybe it's not, it's, it's, it's new to us and that is something called an all clear forecast. Uh, we, we talk about the ability to predict, predict SPEs, but you know, we are also interested in the other way, you know, so we, so we can protect or, or not interrupt missions and that is to try to understand what the all clear forecast is, meaning what's the likelihood of not having an event over the next week so we can tell mission planners that you know, you're free to, to adjust the, the schedule as needed. So that's something that uh, it's, it's, it's very new and we're trying to investigate ways of, of, of having all clear forecasts such that we can help uh, for exploration activities. As Frank alluded to, the F SPE forecasting uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Of those uh, three original uh, categories I talked about, um, probably uh, the best that we can do is at alerts. That's the number one success we have is in alerts. But alerts means the event's ongoing. So there's, uh, when you have a successful program at giving you alerts, um, there's not a lot of, of time you can buy to seek shelter if you need to be, and that's part of our main concept of operations for reducing dose. So they're very good at providing alerts. Uh, you know, the space weather assets are intact right now, and we can utilize alerts to, alerts to positively impact the, the scenario. But as we get to meaningful forecasts, such as long lead time and short, short you know, one-day lead times, uh, the, the probability of success of predicting events uh, falls down tre tremendously. Um, there's a, a huge push in the space 
uh, weather and space science community to try to understand um, the SBE phenomena and how to better predict it with all the space weather asset tools that are being launched through the uh, Science Mission Directorate. Um, currently, our main tools uh, are three spacecraft. The A spacecraft, which is located at L1 between the Earth and the Sun, SOHO, it's a coronagraph that lets them look at CMEs, and that's also at L1. And then the standard GOES satellites uh, for use for terrestrial weather, but we have space weather, to, space weather um, monitors on there that provide uh, the, the primary data for these forecasts. So with the current suite of tools, um, we've, uh, we're continuing to interface with the prediction center and the scientists to give them our inputs for what our needs would be for it to, su to support uh, space weather um, and space weather operations for exploration class missions, and it's it's a matter of time. Um, it's just the 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 missions to look at this are ongoing, and it's going to be several years out for additional solar missions to get additional data to try to help improve these forecasts. Um, one thing that we need to do is ensure that the space weather missions are are, are ongoing, and that space weather. Uh, sensors are included in these space weather missions to help us continue to be able to provide these alerts and these forecasts that the Space Weather uh, uh, Monitoring Center provides us on a daily basis. Um, the other topic I want to talk about and um, was um, operational risk reduction. Um, and that's a little bit different than the, the forecasting idea, but um, when I say operational risk reduction, I want, we want to reduce the impact to the mission. That's what ops is there. We're, we're going to, we want to be mission enablers. Um, and there's two categories to think about, and that's operations planning. We need to plan for the future and how we'll do operations for the future because they're going to be much different to today. And then design, design of current spacecraft and how that, those, uh, the spacecraft have inherent features, hopefully, that may help protect the crew. Uh, and ops planning, we need to uh, uh, continue to watch the forecasting uh, technologies and try to provide uh, inputs to the, to the researchers for the types of forecasts we're going to need, like the all clear forecast. We want to have a constant dialogue with the researchers so they, they know our feedback and our needs and how we would use the data for um, uh, affecting the mission. Um, as Frank talked about earlier, we also, in the ops planning, we want to plan for real-time dosimetry. We want to, we want to have real-time dosimetry um, at the vehicle and uh, uniquely in this, uh, for lunar operations, to have uh, lunar uh, EVA suit monitoring, which currently no, uh, there hasn't been any active monitoring on EVA suits in low Earth orbit. There hasn't been a need. This is going to be a new paradigm for us to actually have monitoring at the, at the, uh, the crew member during an EVA. Um, we also need to ensure for ops planning that we have these space weather resources, as I mentioned earlier, um, at times when we're going to do these missions, 2018 and beyond. Some of the lifetime of the uh, satellites, for instance, the A spacecraft has a limited uh, amount of fuel that uh, hopefully will take us into that time frame. But if the spacecraft fails, that there's plans to have uh, surrogate or uh, replacement satellites such that we can still have f uh, warning data ahead of the event arrival at the, the crew on uh, the lunar surface. So for um, for design, it, it's, uh, it's really trying to specify what kind of particle event we expect the crew to see. And we could talk all day on that. And um, we feel that the, the likely, there, you know, even though the probability of an event may be small, we can talk about the probabilities of events when you, when you deal with categorizing loss of mission statistics or loss of crew statistics, which are probably zero, that if one does occur, you need to understand the vehicle impacts and what the expected crew dose would be um, for a, a particular type of event. And we've liked, we've, uh, uh, to now we've chosen historical events, a large historical event. We want to understand our next vehicle's performance under uh, an exposure of one of those events so we can categorize it ahead of time. And if, if we can, and through the Alara process, have steps to mitigate that dose for one of these large events. So that's part of the design. You know, we're, we're, we're finally getting our foot in the door with trying to impact vehicle design, whereas in, in say, the ISS, where, where we had a program to retrofit the sleep stations with shielding, you know, that was done after the fact. This is we want to do beforehand. We want to see what impacts we can have uh, to design to a, a, a rather strong solar particle event. 
Continue to do work on probabilities of events. Frank and his group have done some great work recently about categorizing the probabilities of some of the worst case events that we're trying to study the vehicle design under. So it's two-handed. You can, we want to have the answer of what the impact of the event is and then the likelihood of the event. So the, uh, the mission planners and, the, and the, the engineers and the project managers can make decisions about how to spend their money and resources. Uh, we also, um, in the, the design uh, approach, we want to rectify or rationalize exposure limits and design criteria. If we go to a vehicle designer and we specify a certain particle event and what the expected dose rate to a, an average crew member inside that his vehicle should be, that should be in line with um, relevant exposure limits. We've tried to work hand in hand with uh, the science side and uh, the radiation health officer to try to understand uh, what exposure limits are we going to try to, to mitigate. Your career uh, at the 95% you know, confidence and uh, ensuring that we also meet the acute effects of, of, uh, of zero probability of effect. So that's all part of the design. And um, I think with that, I can uh, uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you very much, Eddie. Great presentation. Uh, we have time for one question. I have. Professor Petro. Ed, yes. What volume information, what your opinion, what volume information could be delivered to crew member for developing some reaction? on the radiation impact. What volume from radiation monitoring system? The types of data? Yes, okay. types and volume. That's a very good question. Um, right now, we've focused all our efforts on trying to define the correct type of dosimetry systems it should be in vehicles and on suits. So um, the paradigm we're still stuck with, and I think it's, I say stuck with, it's not really stuck with. I think it's served us well and continue to service us, serve, serve us as, uh, looking at absorbed dose and LET-based dose equivalent. Um, until uh, risks uh, are shown that we could uh, change our monitoring strategies, clear differences between an LET-based quality factor and radi radiation weighting factors or RBEs uh, needs to be communicated. Right now, our philosophy is to use the, the ICRP framework, LET-based dose equivalent and absorbed dose. And having the crew uh, trained on, uh, more specifically than they are now, on the, uh, the dose rate thresholds uh, and have procedures that drive them to take positive action based on uh, uh, predetermined flight rules and criteria. So we're going to limit to limit it to, to dose and dose equivalent rate. Special learning for crew member. Special training and learning will be much different than we are now where we can communicate directly and we have time to react to an event. On the lunar surface, we may not. So the crew uh, needs to be very well informed of what a dose rate magnitude would be and what that means to them and et cetera. So it's part of a big picture operational risk reduction planning and training. That's part Thank of what you. I think in NASA call for concepts of operations, I guess. Correct. All right. Any other question? If not, yeah, I think Eddie was very clear in, 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 in terms of one of the big issues here is just to see what is coming out through uh, different assets in space. But as, at the same time, it's critical to have the, the hardware and monitoring technology to measure the actual dose and the, the point that we are concerned of. So I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Rosenfeld that will give us an, a kind of overview. What are those dosimetry systems that will be required for solar particle events for lunar operations? So. Uh, thank you, Marcel. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for kind invitation. It is an honor to be here and deliver my opinion on what kind of detectors we need to have for dosimetry in future uh, lunar expedition. So I'm working at Center of Medical Radiation Physics in Australia, and uh, the main our activities is development radiation detectors for mixed radiation field, gamma neutron charge particle radiation field. If we're talking about space mission in the uh, field of mixed radiation field, particular charged particle, neutrons, and gamma radiation, and mostly it's proton, we need to realize that it's quite complicated dosimetry. You can get very nice dosimeters for protons, but protons interacting with spacecraft and produce a lot of secondary charged particles which affecting astronauts. And all these particles have very wide range of linear energy transfer, which actually determine uh, effect, radiobiological effect. 
So when we are talking about radiation detectors and dosimetry, we need to understand first of all that instrument which we are developing should satisfy radiobiologists. It's absolutely useless to have detectors which measuring gray or just absorb dose. How this absorbed dose can be converted? This is the reason why we are concentrating on development detectors for dose equivalent measurements, which can be applied for wide range of mixed radiation field. Before I will talk you about uh, main developments which we are doing, I would like to emphasize what kind of radiation dosimetry currently uh, used in space and particular <coughs> planned for moon mission. And then I will discuss about new aspects of radiation dosimetry and new approaches which we are developing. First of all, we're using TLD and detector for absorbed dosimetry in different kinds of radiation phantoms. This kind of detector is quite useful. However, you can't read out in real time these detectors. You can read out after mission. Is it useful? Maybe not very useful. It's useful for scientific point of view, but not useful for saving health of our crew. Another kind of detectors is charged particles detectors. Close to the microphone, I think. Yeah. It's charged particle detectors. No. Closer. Charge particle detectors. Charge particle detectors are it's detectors which based on telescope. It's delta E E system which allow you to measure uh, fluence of particle and identification of particles. It's very useful detectors because two concept for determination of risk of radiation. One concept is fluence based concept which allow us to measure spectrum of particle and type of particle, and then prescribe to each kind of particle probability of secondary cancer generation. Another concept is so named dose equivalent concept, which based on microdosimetry. We try to introduce detectors which represent actually effect of interaction of radiation on a cellular level. It's well known tissue equivalent proportional counter. Well, when we're talking about tissue equivalent proportional counter, we're talking about gas detector. Is it easy to use gas detector in a space station? You need to have 1,000 volts. Uh, you need to have a vessel with a gas. You need to change pressure of the gas uh, in order to model different size of cell. You can model from 0.5 micron to 10 microns. Well, it's quite good method well developed, but uh, we would like to offer new method, so named solid state proportional counters. Uh, why it's possible to do? Because currently microelectronic is moving so fast that we were able to develop detectors based on silicon, which represent biological cells. Each detector is based on array of silicon detectors with a size couple microns and less. Such kind of detectors allow you to measure microdosimetric spectra. If you know microdosimetric spectra, it's absolutely not important to know what kind of radiation around. It doesn't matter. You're measuring microdosimetric spectrum, then you're converting this microdosimetric spectrum to dose equivalent used well-known defined factor Q, quality factor, which is a function of linear energy. However, we are not sure that its quality factor is correct. Each year we have improvement based on our radiobiological research, but we are working on concept existing quality factor. Well, such kind of detectors are currently almost developed jointly with U.S. Navy Academy, Professor Pisacana, who is leading project and it's supported by NSBRI. Another step in dosimetry, also real time dosimetry. It's dosimetry which is based on nanoscale. Even we know spectrum of linear energy transfer, it's not enough to predict radiobiological effect. It's well-known experiment with the same <laughs> linear energy transfer, different <coughs> biological experiment. We can get the same ratio, z squared over v squared, but effect biological is different. So it will be good, certainly, to know track structure. Is it possible to develop detectors and very simple dosimeter which will be responsible to track structure and will be real-time dosimeter with alarm? Yes, it's possible. It's possible based on quantum dots. 
and we're working in a new direction, development detector based on quantum dots, where size of actually uh, testing medium is two, three nanometers, similar to DNA. And our impression is based on our theoretical estimation, it's possible to predict DSB using response of such kind of detectors. And this work in progress and first results will be in one year. Now, if we are talking about skin dosimetry, it's another important factor which we need to know. How to measure skin dose? Is the TLD detectors good for us? It's also not good because TLD detector mostly 0.8 millimeter, 0.6 millimeter uh, thickness. When we're talking about skin dose, we're talking about 70 microns depth where basal layer is. And result obtained with one millimeter detector absolutely useless. So how is it possible to do this? We develop new detector, MOSKIN, metal oxide skin effect detectors, which allow you to measure on reproducible depth 70 micron and more. It depends what your needs. Such kind of detectors, unfortunately, not very sensitive in terms of low dose. Uh, the minimum what we can measure at the moment 0.1 milli, 0.1 centisiever, 0.1 centisiever. Certainly, it's necessary to improve this. However, uh, we definitely do supporting detectors like uh, passive detectors, track detectors. If we're talking about track detectors, it's important for neutron dosimetry. However, again, it's passive detector, and it's not real-time detector. What you can do if you will estimate those later. On this point of view, it's necessary to put more efforts in development silicon system for neutron dosimetry. It's so named uh, silicon detector based on unfolding technology where we're using effect of interaction neutrons with silicon due to an elastic reaction, not just result of converter, not result of we're obtaining usually with uh, Bonner sphere. Bonner sphere is also nice dosimeter. However, it's not so practical. Currently exists space dosimeter based on Bonner sphere, but they're small, so they can measure only part of spectrum of neutron, and unfortunately, it also will be not essential. Not w essential. One minute. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, in conclusion, I would like uh, to put your attention that we need to develop further solid state dosimetry. It's clear stated in recent statement from NSBRI to support solid state dose equivalent dosimetry development and gas dose equivalent dosimetry development. It is important not only on point of view risk prediction, it is important in prediction how good our mathematical tools for radiation transport simulation. You capable to measure response of the detectors and compare this response with simulation. Based on this, we can estimate how good our tools and in future to use our tools for prediction effect and particular for prediction how good is protection. So this is what I would like to emphasize today and any question I will be happy to answer. Thank you. I think you also you, you um, uh, raise another issue that uh, we are very proud to, from the NSVR point of view that we are supporting the development of a new EVA real-time dosimeter for lunar operations and mm -hmm. we, are, we are doing substantial investment to support uh, gas-based technology and solid-state detectors and we are very encouraged. That. And I think, Eddie, you want to say some comments in terms of... Um, yeah, and maybe I can, uh, one thing about SPE monitoring specifically, and I think uh, Anatoly talked about general principles of monitoring. And for SPEs, um, I'd like to say maybe absorbed dose is not dead, potentially. Um, doing a depth dose and using the quantity of absorbed dose in tissue still may prove useful and, and still robust and simple to get... Uh, to use as a protection device. I think um, we have to d differentiate between what's an alarming or an operationally controlling dosimeter versus an area dosimeter that is more broadly responsive to all the particles and would uh, help with risk. So for uh, you know, NASA's plans, as it currently sta stands for EVA dosimetries, to be robust, be, have a wide dynamic range, and still be able to do absorbed dose in depth um, um, and, and it's difficult to develop 
conops and develop uh, uh, develop um, strategies on a moving biological target. Um, a lot of the biological research that's uh, ongoing, even in SRL, say, you know, the, 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 the primary dosimetry is, is ion chambers. It's absorbed dose. And I know the reconciliation between the secondaries and uh, the true nature of the field with the result of an experiment is, is forthcoming. But a lot of the con uh, uh, control for the biological experiments for SBEs are, are absorbed dose. And I don't know if, if some of anybody else on the panel would like to comment about I that. Come, I think that Dr. Roosevelt's last comment was the most important one, that the dosimetry system should be designed to verify a real-time computational capability right. because shielding is changing throughout the, the uh, human presence. If, if someone's over there, the dose is going to be different over here. So dosimetry should be designed to, to verify and validate. So a computational system that, that can then extrapolate. Even the example of the skin dose is interesting. We've already published that for a solar particle event on the moon, the skin doses will vary by a tenfold across the body. So the soft skin is the important region because uh, it, it's the most sensitive for both uh, acute and cancer risk. But the soft skin dose is typically higher than the dose in uh, other regions that have not been exposed to UV, for example. And the cancer risk will be higher from the genetic effects across the person's lifetime from their UV exposure. So, so yeah, I think you have to rethink how you design the dosimetry model because you're really mass limited. You can't fly multiple spectrometers in space. So you really need to th think about what type of dosimetry system validates a computational model that can then extrapolate across the the presence of humans in the mission. It's the biologist back again. <laughs> so um, the issue of thinking about pro proton dosimetry, um, f even at the NSRL, you bring bring this up as a as an issue, and the way we do dosimetry and the best controlled ground experiments we have, right? Uh, we, I was having this discussion with Dr. Kennedy last night about how do you think about proton dosimetry when you're working with low energy protons mm -hmm. and you have a thick target, like a mouse, for example, never mind a person, uh, and the mouse is moving in the field. And so uh, your, uh, your physical dosimetry in terms of absorbed dose uh, is, is a random vector based on the position of your biological sample and its, its uniformity of, of uh, movement in, in a field that's a mixed field. And so I think of dosimetry in these kinds of situations, the, the best thing you can do is represent the incident fluence and the energy spectrum that you're providing incident and then describe the biological target that you're looking at. Because it's uh, and leave it leave it to the people who sit and think about radiation transport through complex uh, systems that have different uh, uh, absorption coefficients and scattering properties to do the phantom measurements to then give you a better estimate of hmm. exposure. I'm not even sure I'm going to say dose. Right. So this this is a real problem for radiobiologists and many of the radiobiologists still don't know that it's a problem for them, but they're going to find out. <laughs> and a, a follow-on to what Frank said, if you have dosimeters that, can, that you can use to compare models, uh, the more complicated you get in the monitoring, uh, you know, if you get to track structure phenomena in a dosimeter or measuring nanoscale doses, that, that means you've got to take your, you have to deal with that on the calculational level as well, not only radiation transport, but using track structure theory to, to unfold what you've seen. So, I guess there's a fine balance in, in, in trying to utilize the mass that's available to use uh, for both operational controlling dose and for risk estimation. I think it's a, a lot to be learned, a lot to, 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 to talk. And Dr. Roosevelt, track structure. I think yeah. that my point was that you should look at depth dose and energy right. spectrum. Okay. But to, to think about those, well, those symmetry yeah. systems okay, so as a way to validate the computational right. model that can then calculate anything. Yes. Right. I agree. I was trying I to, agree, the I two agree. comments, try to uh, resolve the two. Because for forecasting of solar particle events, we must measure the energy spectrum of proton, not only those. Differential energy spectrum. Well, I think it's a, it's a challenge, and we are working on that. And at the end of the day, whatever we provide, we need to provide some data that will be useful for astronauts in terms of those uh, initials. 
unexpected events. Uh, you know, I think it's a long, long uh, way still to work in what kind of uh, technologies or computer modeling we'll use for that. But at the end of the day, we need to provide something for the mission control and astronauts or cosmonauts working on the moon. And we discuss uh, space weather, we discuss uh, dosimetry systems and those requirements, but I would like to see of uh, the view of the radiation health officer in terms of how uh, that person will integrate this information and will be an interface with the flight surgeons and how you will manage those data for, for the well-being of the astronauts during, after, or, or before the mission. So I'd like to introduce Mary Van Berlin. Please, Mary. Good morning. Um, I'm relatively new to the spaceflight industry. I've only been with NASA for about five years. I come from an academic medical center um, role where I worked largely with physicians. And I think I was hired at NASA to functionally be the physicist to physician dictionary. Because while the Space Radiation Analysis Group reports a large amount of information to both the flight surgeons and the flight directors, the flight surgeons often don't know what they're doing with that data to give that information to their crew member. We talk about dosimetry systems, and in those dosimetry systems, we want our crew members to be able to make decisions. And so I think us communicating and developing with the flight surgeons is kind of our first step in helping us develop concept of operations that would allow crew members to make their own decisions. So once we can educate the flight surgeons and we can test with them that these ideas work and that our dosimetry systems give them the right information, don't take this the wrong way, then we can move on to the crew members and help them make their own decisions. Um, we have a lot of experience in just confusing our flight surgeons and we have experience in confusing our crew members with the information that we give them. And if we expect our crew members to make decisions on the surface of the moon, in preparation for making decisions in a Mars mission, we really have to get good at that communication role. Um, so I think that was part of why I was hired. Um, my colleagues here make a lot of very, very valid points about dosimetry systems, make a lot of very valid points about what information is needed in order um, to truly understand the risks. My role at the end of that is to calculate and perform a risk assessment on the crew member and keep those records for that crew member and make some determination at some point if that crew member could fly again or again and so forth. My role is also in that to help the flight surgeons understand what actions might be taken during a mission in a solar particle event and should we disrupt the timeline in that fashion. Everyone here in this panel agrees that when we go back to the surface of the moon, it will be inevitable that solar particle events will occur during that mission. And solar particle events will occur while that crew member is EVA. That will be an inevitability. What that impact is to the mission, the, the crew member's career, needs to be much more fully understood. Um, I agree very strongly that we really do need to understand the dose and dose rate um, and that effect to what that medically might mean to the crew member. We need to really understand the incidence or potential um, situation where prodromal syndrome might occur on a long EVA where the crew member needs to remain out. Um, we need to be able to understand with and through monitoring of that crew member, be able to communicate to the surgeon that if prodromal effects actually do occur, which are relatively innocuous, as far as any medical condition, na nausea, vomiting, fatigue, those kinds of things, they're not easily discerned between other clinical situations. Is the crew member been exposed to an event? Do they have a particular sensitivity to that event? Or are they just generally ill? The surgeons are gonna need to understand that and be able to communicate with them. And the astronauts are also gonna be able to need to, set, to understand what's being um, addressed here. We're going to have to get away from this helpless feeling. We're going to have to be able to say whether or not we think that's the result of the event. Of the event. Um, I do believe very strongly, and Eddie and I have fought with a lot of program managers about the importance of monitoring on the vehicle and on the crew. And the program managers may have a hard time understanding why we want multiple systems and why on the vehicle maybe is not good enough 
Why do we also have to have it on the crew? Could it be on the rover instead? We keep arguing we want as much data as possible at the crew member so we can help determine whether or not these things have occurred. A lot of people have heard me say this um, quite a bit, and the colleagues here have all talked about what we need to learn. And this was going to be an ongoing learning experience. Currently, we are designing a mission. We are designing a vehicle, and we're designing a vehicle that will go back to the ISS, and will go to ISS and eventually on to Moon. We're doing that with what we know now. We know, we're doing that with the information we have today. We have very elaborate, very good research program to help us um, um, reduce the amount of uncertainties we have in the risk to our crew members. And so we are going to be continuing to learn things over the next 10 years. And so the decisions and the requirements that we wrote today or the last, in the last couple of years may not be perfect and they may have to be adjusted. And we're going to have to make those changes. And we're going to have to become very flexible in this. My husband, who's been an engineer with NASA, um, cautions me often. He's been there 20 years now. He cautions me often to remain positive and flexible, that that is an important skill to have with working with this in this agency. And I think it will be important to remain very positive and flexible in this. As a research provides us new information, we're going to have to change how we do our modeling, and we're going to have to change our requirements. It's going to have to be vetted in a place where we fully understand the changes that we are making. But again, we have to remain positive and flexible in that. Um, um, and again, I guess I make the point again very strongly that we are planning with what we know now. The next set of vehicles will have to apportion some different amount of risk to that, and we may make very different decisions. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say. I think there's some benefits to going towards the end. Everybody says everything else first, and you get to be short and concise. Um, but I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Question for Mary? No? Uh, Petra? So, uh, how, how do you ambition uh, an architecture from your point of view in terms of your functions during lunar operations? In my current role, what I do for selection is look at what the crew member's history has been up to that point. Any previous missions that they've flown on, any medical exposures that they might have had, or any aviation training they might have had. And I provide some sort of a you know, prediction um, uh, to the flight surgeon for what that mission would look like. Most of the time, solar particle events that occur in the shuttle or station are minimal, and they only affect that dose estimation to a small degree. Um, and generally, the estimation stays consistent and constant through the, throughout the mission. And so large you know, shifts in planning do not have to occur. Um, for a solar particle event that during a long EVA, and so for argument's sake, let's say this worst case or a large solar particle event, that dose estimation might be quite high and might adjust the prediction that we made before the astronaut flew. And we might have to make some decisions. Marcello and I have been part of a group that, uh, with the flight surgeons to look at, um, do we actually think that there's a potential for a lethal radiation event on the surface of the moon? And we think that that actually is approaching near zero. But do we think that there's a chance of you know, losing some mission objective or exceeding a NASA standard as a result? Um, that, that is not actually zero and probably not approaching zero, and there's probably a high percentage in that. And so operationally, we're actually going to have to be looking at what the potential doses are, I believe, to the crew member in addition to that prediction and talking to the flight surgeons about the potential for exceeding standards. Amy? One thing I, I would like to um, bring up as a research topic, and it's a research topic, I'd like to make it very clear that that's what it is, is the issue of inter-individual variation in sensitivity. And this we know from uh, studies with other kinds of sparsely ionizing radiation exists. The range of what's normal in the general population is an area of intense ongoing investigation, and it can be magnified. Uh, the range of sensitivity 
uh, among apparently normal individuals can be magnified at low dose rates. And so this is an area I think that NASA is investing some money in. I think some of I think ESA is interested in this area as well. I'm not as familiar with what our Russian colleagues are doing, but I know the Japanese have been interested in this question as well. And then considering uh, as besides the risk for protons, but also whether this issue of inter-individual variability in response exists for the heavier, heavier ions, I think is a major open question. Mm -hmm. And I do not presume in any way to uh, ask NASA how they would or would not incorporate this kind of information once it can be provided because we're too far away from that now. But I do think it's an important area for investigation. Uh, when you say far away, and um, maybe Francis can, can help us with that, how far away are, in reality, to, to do this kind of assessment in terms of individual susceptibility for lunar or, or maybe for Mars? Maybe we are not ready for lunar. You think it will be ready for lunar selection or, or not? Okay, so the, um, Congress has chartered the um, National Council of Radiation Protection and Measurements to guide federal agencies. So we have a, an NCRP panel now looking at this question, and they're, they're about to uh, go into the final review of the document. But they've concluded that we're many years away from being able to do this. There's a few very obvious traits like the AT homozygotes that you could call out and identify those people, but even AT heterozygotes, which this is, so this is the most common genetic defect related to radiation sensitivity or the most pronounced one, and there's estimates that's one to three percent of the population are AT heterozygotes, but so there are tests for that syndrome that you can make on astronauts or other workers. Um, it's not ethical or legal, legal right now, but the, the bottom line is the impact of being an AT heterozygote is really an open question. So, and then, so that one is one of the more likely ones you could test for, but what does it mean is still an open question. Now, then you go down to um, lower penetrance uh, genes that have radiation impacts, and it's harder to test for those, and then the impacts are even more uh, fuzzy. And then you get into things like SNPs, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. There's There's ways to test that, but there's no really, there's not enough knowledge on what you would do with that information. Is it someone who is an A2 heterozygote, are they 10% more susceptible, 20% more susceptible? That information just isn't there. So it would be at least 20 years. But um, on the other hand, many government agencies led by NIH are looking into this problem. Uh, they're, they're, most of their uh, interests are with patients treated for uh, radiation, uh, cancer, or other diseases, cancer uh, with chemotherapy, or other diseases, what, what are the, their best responses to these, and how does that vary from individual to individual? But th So there they're doing much more, and they can be much more aggressive because you have a risk-benefit ratio that's much more important for someone that uh, has a fatal disease or even a, a non-fatal disease, so that they can do much more with those patients, and it's an active area of research. Thank you. One last question, so we can move on for the final presentation. Even in the absence of, of uh, genotype information, you can phenotype individuals for their sensitivity. So my, I've got a hypothetical question. Mm -hmm. We can do that now. So let's say we had six astronauts and we could phenotype them you know, for, it, for their response to radiation exposure in terms of their DNA damage. If you identified one individual to be more sensitive than the others. I, dis that? I disagree that you can do that because the, there's still a large debate about what it means because we, we fund, we have like a, close to a $40 million research program and there's no consensus on what causes cancer from radiation. There's, there's a, a, a collective group that thinks DNA damage leading to mutation and genomic instability is the cause of cancer. There's another group that believe it's extracellular matrix changes that causes cancer. So you, the phenotypes you can test for, there's no way to get to a number on in an individual what their cancer risk would be at this time. So that, that's what we're researching, but right now you can't do anything well, with that information. The consensus right now is, is you wouldn't act on it. Is that correct? It's premature. It's premature. And what do you act on for, um, for acute risk as opposed to delayed effects related to any of the degenerative endpoints or carcinogenesis may be very different. 
I only raise the topic because I think it's a research topic. I but think I, th I think you kind of add to what I was trying to say, Amy, is while there are a lot of um, scientific um, studies ongoing and a lot of knowledge out there, our operational procedures, in fact, may seem quite simple. Operationally, in comparison, they may seem quite simple, and it may seem that NASA is making stupid, if you will, decisions. And I don't think that that's truly the case. I would like to you know, submit that you're very carefully considering this, and we keep these very simple operations. I mean, I appreciate you bringing it up, because it may have sounded like I was only speaking of something very, very simple, but it's very well vetted and very well carefully thought through and very well developed by Frank's group as an operational tool to use, and we will stay with that operational tool until there is a good consensus to make those changes. So I appreciate you bringing it up, because I think it, it does help the story. I think we agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. While we're on this topic, another one is age. So I think most people, even to the top level NASA, know about the radiation uh, dose limits, how they depend on age, and all that information is is now likely to be changed. The um, the recent beer seven. So this is the United uh, National Academy of Science Committee that publishes every ten years on what the risk of cancer is. And right now, age is the most important trade variable. It, it does much more value to pick an older astronaut than to add tons of shielding. But the new information says that the age dependence is much weaker. So NASA will have to go to a model where right now we 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 project that someone 55 has two times less cancer risk than someone 35. In the new models, it's much softer. It's only about a 40% less chance of cancer for someone 55, so it becomes a, so all that information that people are making assumptions on, the new information from research and science says it's, it's all uh, soft and it's going in the other direction. I think we can continue with this in an in, in open discussion in a few minutes. So uh, I would like to introduce the final speaker today, and just with a brief introduction that we, we at the end of the, of the day, when we go back to the moon and go to Mars, uh, protection strategies will be a multi-factor. We have different approaches. It will not be one single bullet that will solve the problem. And medical countermeasure is one of them. And uh, the still, we don't know what kind of medical countermeasure, but there is a lot of advances recently in terms of uh, um, countermeasures, medical countermeasure for conventional radiation, and some protons too. And uh, we are very lucky to have Dr. James Tour here with us. And I would like to uh, ask him to give us a kind of brief overview of these new strategies or new compounds that potentially can be very useful for medical countermeasure for spaceflight utilization. Thank you, and, and um, uh, this, is, this is certainly an unusual form for me. I, uh, the more I hear, the more I wonder why I got involved in this, this uh, problem. <laughs> this is uh, really quite complex. And, and just to give you a bit of background, uh, I'm funded by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency uh, uh, just since January. And after serving on the Defense Science Board, it became clear that there was a uh, increasing risk on uh, nuclear or radiological terrorist attacks and and could we do something for the general population to mitigate the damage that may occur uh, to large numbers of people based on radiation exposure and from hearing what's going on in this community uh, uh, I think that we could certainly learn from one another the program that I'm involved with was started in January, was to be a 12-month program, and uh, uh, the director of DARPA tried to compress it to a six-month program, and we finally agreed up upon a nine-month program. So imagine what, what could be done, certainly in an academic environment. Uh, uh, what we have found, uh, the program is, has two parts. One is a, a dosimetry program where most of the people are involved, and that is to be able to assess an individual after an event how much exposure or, or what is their state after the, the, uh, the exposure. Uh, I've heard some of the presentations at, at the initial kickoff meeting. The one that was, was of most interest to me was looking at, at, at the proteins in the blood that occurred because of the, the cells that had fractured. Uh, uh, and, and that looked to me to be a very rapid response and, and something that, that information will be gaining on and, and uh, within a few minutes to have an idea of, of the seriousness uh, as tracked uh, over, over a, a, say, a one-week period after the event. 
Uh, but but uh, the part that we are involved in is a mitigation process. Can we use nanotechnology to mitigate the effects of radiation exposure? Could something be delivered to an individual 12 hours after the event? And some of our early results were really quite exciting. Uh, the assay that we're using the, is the assay that, that many people have used is the, the crypt cells uh, in the jejunum uh, to see the, the, uh, uh, the, the counts that, that would remain after exposure. This is in work in collaboration with MD Anderson, the, the uh, oncologist there, and also with UT Health Science Center. We also have another assay that we, we first work on cellular assay, then we go to the zebrafish assay where we can expose the zebrafish and look at the curvature of, of their spine, of the vertebrae, uh, in the zebrafish. And just to give you some indication of what we do is we take a nanometer-sized particle, specifically a single wall nanotube, and we attach to that cargo. We know that the single wall nanotubes have rapid penetration into cells when they're functionalized correctly. We can also direct them not just into the cell, but directly to the nucleus based on what we functionalize them with. We can carry large amounts of cargo on the outside of the single walled nanotube. Very simple cargo that we're carrying in some of our models is BHT, butylated hydroxytoluene. It's a common compound in fast foods. It's an antioxidant. It's a very potent antioxidant, and that's why, for example, uh, if you make bread today, tomorrow it's stale, you can keep Wonder Bread on a shelf for two months, and it's nice and soft and chewy. It's because of BHA and BHT. It are these, these moieties that are non-toxic, used in foods, used in cosmetics that we're appending to the sidewalls of the carbon nanotubes. Some of the indications that we have on different compounds that we've used, for example, when we've exposed zebrafish to uh, 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 10 gray to 15 gray of radiation, 70% uh, of them have severe damage to the vertebrae by, based on the curvature of the spine, 30% have, have uh, uh, minor damage. Uh, none of them uh, uh, show no effects. But when we administer the carbon nanotubes, uh, either shortly before or shortly after, we can have 30% of them show no effect from the radiation, 30% of them minor, and 30% of them major. In the mouse assay, some of the things that we've shown is that we can have, uh, uh, use one five thousandth the dose of the carbon nanotubes that we would of amophostine to see the same effects in survival of the intestinal crypts. So this idea of being able to append to a nanometer-sized entity and then deliver that, it's much like uh, 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 troops attacking a beach. They don't jump off the ship, attack the beach. They go in amphibious vehicles that bring large numbers of troops. They hit the area of, uh, of interest and then disperse from there. So we're, we're, it's this Trojan horse concept, and we're delivering in this way. Uh, right now, all of the, the administering in, in the zebrafish has been to the yolk sac, to the mice have been through the IV injection in the tail vein. Uh, but of course, of interest to mass, uh, 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 to, to administer to masses, it's going to have to be in an oral-based system. So we're developing hydrogel-based systems that will, will hold these cargos in the acidic environment of the stomach and then release it in the alkaline environment of, of the small intestines. Uh, these are the, the types of things that we've seen. We have extremely high ORAC assay numbers, so extremely high uh, uh, ability to scavenge radicals is, that, is, is what we're, we're seeing already, and the effects of that, and, and how we're seeing a, a, a tracking of that effect. So as long as we can carry the, these cargos into the cells and be able to mitigate this biological cascade that follows the initial event, because all of our dosing is, is uh, right now, is we're going uh, post-radiation event. So the initial effects of the, the cleavages are, are done in, in milliseconds. We can't stop that. But in order to mitigate the biological cascade that follows, that is what, what we're seeking. And I think that uh, certainly from what I hear uh, uh, in this community, there's, there's a lot more understanding than what we have. And I think that based on what we've done, we've actually been very lucky. Uh, based on what we've been able to see so far. And with that, I'll open it for questions. Thank you very much. I, I think I want to point it out that uh, any strategies for, for uh, mitigate the risk or at least uh, prevent health risk for astronaut solar particle event, we, we have some initial 
risk that we are addressing as a prodromal effect, skin damage, maybe some hematological changes. But as the panel mentioned several times, uh, solar particle event is also inside a more complex environment. And imagine uh, a lunar outpost astronaut living for six months, will, they will be exposed to galactic cosmic rays and a low, low, low chronic doses plus solar particle events. So when we address solar particle events mitigation and strategies, also we need to mention other things that uh, they are related to late effects or related risk to solar particle events. We know that there are some strategies for this prodromal syndrome, for skin damage, and one of the goals for NSBRI new center is to validate those uh, known strategies for proton events. But still, we don't know some other risks that can attend. And one of the uh, strategies that Dr. Torres mentioned is, is one of them, and there are others that they are actively investigating right now under Francis program, our program, and we're looking forward for those new strategies. So, for questions for Dr. Tour or from the panel, any comment from the panel? No? Uh, please, Dr. Pellis. Just out of curiosity, with the, the uh, uh, modifications you've done using VHT, how much do you change the stoichiometry of free radical scavenging for carbon nanotubes? Because they naturally have some, as I recall, right? It, and the, it's a, like a 21 ratio or right. something the like that. The nanotubes are extremely good free radical uh, traps, the nanotubes themselves. Mm -hmm. The BHT, the BHA, actually what we can do is we can sequester them and so that they could probably go further than the nanotube itself could go. If you look at the ORAC assays, there's nothing better than a carbon nanotube uh, on a mass basis, certainly on a molar basis, but even on a mass basis, there's nothing better than the nanotube itself. But being a larger structure, even though we cut them down chemically to be about 60 nanometers in length and they're about a, a nanometer in, in diameter, and it's, it's, it's that aspect ratio that allows them to slide on into the, through the cell membrane. But then, then their ability to get into other locations may be limited, and that's where the BHA, the BHT that's just sequestered can go out and do its job. One, one other thing, very quickly, is just that you make some comments on, on CNTs and their potential for toxicity. Sure. Right. So all the work that's been done that's ever been shown on, on the toxicity of carbon nanotubes by themselves have been in unfunctionalized systems, unfunctionalized carbon nanotubes. So we often derivatize our carbon nanotubes, and that greatly decreases the, the toxicity. The other thing that we do is all of our carbon nanotubes are water-soluble and PBS-soluble. So we have drastically modified the behavior. We see zero toxicity, so that's the first test that we do. We will do a, a number of cell lines and look at toxicity, and we, we monitor, do they get into the cells? Either we look at the inherent fluorescence that remains from them, or we attack on, attach on a fluorophore, and then we see uh, uh, what are the effects on the cells. So we are seeing no toxicity from the many cell lines that we've studied. Okay, I think if we, we complete the, the presentation of each of the panel members, and I will again, to, and, and my behalf, and Dr. Petrov, uh, thanks to all the panelists. And now is the opportunity to uh, uh, broad discussions, uh, and I think if, uh, Professor Petrov want to mention or make an introduction before the... Uh, I would like to add a few comments. I would like to add a few comments uh, with respect to the conclusions that can be made on the basis of our discussion today. First, I think, I think that uh, you now get the understanding with respect to the complexity of this problem, which is um, necessary to take into account when we're talking about lunar expeditions and their participants. I would like to say a few words about evaluating that danger. First of all, how we can modify the risk as an instrument for evaluation of that hazard. For deterministic effects, those that have to do with acute radiation, normally a threshold level is used and we use all the methods available to us in order to preclude the exceedance of the threshold, which can also be, which can be exceeded in case 
emergency, but this is a situation that we are not uh, expecting or planning on. And uh, in the, on the surface of the moon, we will have a situation that during uh, solar particle proton events, any dose that we have pre um, predicted may be exceeded. So what is considered an emergency on the ground for moon is normal radiation environment. And one has to underscore that this is the environment that is a stochastic environment. In other words, the probability of uh, the incident of uh, the solar particle event, proton event, with a probability above zero. We need to take that into account when we are deriving the risk of radiation exposure from solar particle events. At the ground condition, the risk is evaluated as the probability of exceeding the preset threshold. And so that is associated with a certain reduction of life expectancy up to 40 years. And so on the moon, we have a normal situation in case of a solar particle event when it can involve a low or medium or high dose and we need to take that into account as a value characterizing the level of the danger. So when we're talking about the radiation risk and the situation, we understand that on the ground it's associated with um, stochasticity of radiobiological effects, while on the moon it's a combination of two stochastic events, solar proton event and radiobiological consequences. So the risk as an application to those assessments has to be based on a composition of two stochastic processes that together would give you the probability of the effect, the probability of additional loss due to all the possible outcomes, cancerogenic outcomes and deterministic effects of those, those that appear immediately after the impact. That's one aspect. And the second thing is the question that's associated, associated with the din dynamics of irradiation during an SPE. At the low Earth orbits, we have a very significant moderation by the geomagnetic field. And so for the surface of the moon, it would be continuous impact that has to do with the dose raising to the maximum levels. And we need to evaluate the effect of this exposure, such as that after the first radiation impact, starting from the cellular and um, organ and uh, organism as a whole level, the regeneration processes start um, getting into effect. So we are looking at to the methodology that we have developed today with respect to uh, include into the evaluation of probability of the events the nature of the regulation protection um, response of the organism. So you cannot use just one coefficient, but a function that is derived from the um, extent of the dose and uses we, we called it an effective dose before, but I would rather say current that um, works to uh, produce this effect. And the other aspect is the, comp is the neutron component because, the, as I mentioned during uh, my initial presentation, that per each proton we will have one neutron, high energy neutron, which is different from the proton by the quality coefficient or the coefficient of a relative biological effectiveness will be quite more significant for cytogenetic effects. For um, high energy neutrons, the, with the, the, ex, with the re dose will be for neutrons, high energy neutrons, the effect will be 30 or 40 times higher. Another aspect has to do with predicting uh, the so solar space rays. We do not know to this day the mechanism of um, how the solar proton events come about, what, how they originate. So we have a significant 
the role of uncertainty of um, evaluating the results of the events in the space to the solar events. We need to take that into account when we evaluate radiational danger. And so the methodology for developing radiational predictions is very important in order to ensure radiation safety of the lunar expeditions. And one of the more serious questions has to do with interaction of the radiation safety services with the crew at the lunar mission, the lunar operations for what we have now. This technology has been well developed. The main volume of the information and the analysis is based in the radiation ser safety service. Cosmonauts and astronauts follow the recommendations from this service, and sometimes they end up in the situations that our cosmonaut astronaut colleague described. Uh, but we need to make sure that our system is extremely reliable, and so we need to look at the situation when we have, uh, say, communication outages, and so if we perform this analysis, but we may not be able to let them know anything other than they have to hide, but how and what they have to do is uh, not going to be known to them. So the radiation monitoring system on the moon needs to be such that it would be possible not only to measure the dose, but also the char other characteristics that would enable us to evaluate the consequences of radiation exposure, and it should be available information-wise to the crew of the mission, because under the circumstances when we run into the issues that cannot let us use the ground-based complex, only operational decisions on the spot may be deemed effective for radiation safety. So this is the implementation of the LR principle when we need to make sure that the, the crew is protected by the efforts of everybody who participates in this work, including the crew themselves. So we need to improve the level of awareness and uh, the level to which the crew is informed on these issues. When it's applicable to the lunar programs in the future, when we are discussing these issues and uh, the approaches for these types, of course, we are we are looking more at the Martian flights, but these are the requirements and these are the objectives for us that are important to fulfill, such as radiation monitoring and the protection of the crew. And these efforts need to be undertaken by everybody when we we have the minimal uh, in, in involvement or minimal resources sources, but uh, the maximum results. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Petra. Well, uh, questions from the audience, please. Um, short one and a follow up. Uh, given that we've got 55, just about 50 odd years of solar particle event monitoring, how confident is the solar physics community that the spectrum of events we see represents the spectrum of events that's out there given the four billion year history of the sun? And then, in follow up to that is, Given that one of your goals is risk prediction, and it sounds to me like you've got dozens of interacting stochastic events before you can get to the inter individual variability, before you get into the, 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 the organ specific responses, realistically within the operational time frame of lunar exploration, are you going to be able to deliver something that says, with this mission profile, you will have a less than 3% absolute risk of whatever? Because uh, it sounds to me like not, but I'm probably displaying my massive ignorance of this. Uh, yeah, so, um, of, of course, the people are willing to take that risk because we, we can quantify the risk with error bars. And that's the approach NASA uses. I think NASA is the only uh, U.S. government agency that's now adopted that confidence intervals are part of their radiation protection system. So, And even on solar particle events, we can give confidence intervals what the probability of event would be. And it's, like I said earlier, that it's it's less than 5% inside a vehicle and less than 10% on EVA. But even within those percentages, 5 to 10%, the, the outcomes are not uh, life, immediate life loss. There, there's uh, extra lifetime cancer risk, um, possibility of prodromal risk. So I think people are willing to take those risks. But the, the mission planners and the cost of the mission are going to be driven by those numbers that you have to have criteria that set requirements on what shielding would be, what's uh, how far away from a from a lunar habitat will you go on your EVA? So all these things are going to be cost-driven, and they're going to be driven by how well you can predict these, these things that you mentioned. 
Can you wait until the microphone? I, I can give additional information. We calculate the risk induced by uh, caused by the uh, stochastic effects for Mars mission duration 720 days, and additional risk connected with prodromal effects. Uh, and comparison of this risk, uh, there is 6% for stochastic effect and 1.5% for prodromal effect, as additional probability of death of crew member during the flight and after the flight. And it's another it's a comparable value, comparable value, absolutely. And it's, uh, to clarify, you asked about the, the types and the, the, the solar physics question. The number of events that have been seen, luckily that the, the, the spectra uh, is widely varying, but what we know now is that the relatively soft and moderate shielding can buy you uh, a tremendous amount in, in, in moderating any acute effects. So all the span that we have seen, that the, the depth dose is workable for managing acute effects. Yeah. But, but there also is papers on uh, the physics of the plasma acceleration that give an upper bound on what, what the highest energies the particles could be, and the, uh, actually also an upper bound on what the f total fluxes from a, a plasma would be. So that there is information that seems to indicate that the, the largest events we've seen, and the, these are uh, nitrates and ice core samples, so the, the largest one we know about is from 1859, and that, that seems to be right where the prediction of the upper bound would be. It's, it's interesting compared with the Apollo program attitude, and I have the, the, the privilege to meet uh, Mr. Ronnie Rose. He was part of uh, 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 the radiation protection group at the Apollo program, and he was mentioned some of the strategies uh, that they have at that time, and they counted for Apollo 11 or uh, no more, like a uh, uh, 24 hours advance a warning at that time, and they were kind of no concern because they had 24 hours at that time to prevent anything. So kind of quite a different uh, uh, right now, and still they were concerned. The, the major risk for them at that time was vomiting. It's still the same problem uh, that we consider now at this point. And they do some calculations to alleviate uh, work bad if the rover is disabled. So they, we are discussing the same problems at some point. And uh, still we have certain unknowns that we, they are the old ones, and we need to address them. So, uh, questions? Uh, please. I'd, I'd like to follow up on, on the question that was just asked and, and ask the panel uh, to move a little bit from a reductive approach by individual discipline, per se, and think a little bit more about an integrative approach here about our feasibility uh, for the lunar operations that are currently being planned by NASA, which are quite ambitious, as you know. Marcelo mentioned it at the start. Uh, they would include, uh, uh, I guess, the, the, the nominal approach would be 180 days um, on the lunar surface, including over 100 EVAs. Uh, some of which are likely to extend 500 to 1,000 kilometers at some point uh, from uh, the home base. And I'm just wondering, when we start to put those pieces together, whether you believe our current knowledge base and the anticipated technology advances in knowledge base are consistent with that, uh, that what seems like an ambitious approach uh, uh, and planning. I, th I think it, uh, my colleagues will tell in detail, but as far as I know, there is the, the lunar architecture is, is in flux. There are some e ideas running still. It's not defined yet. But one uh, big issue uh, is the, um, the, the, the capability to have a small pressurized rover inside the architecture that will provide some shielding as you move along to the different distances. That will be a, an interesting factor in in how to mitigate the risk and how to manage the risk. And I open Francis and Eddie to comment on that. Yeah, so there's, there's a study that uh, we're doing with Mike Gernhardt. I think Mike will be here this afternoon if he's not here already, but with a pressurized rover with, it takes about 500 pounds of shielding to, to get the dose down to below any of the NASA standards. It also gives you the advantage that you can drive the rover. We've done studies of the typical basin on the lunar surface. So, so on the surface of the moon, you have two pi shielding already, but if you can drive close to a basin and there's plenty of basins, different sizes, different depths, that you can approach an, another um, 30 degrees of shielding. So, so you could, we were just looking at the, the mass requirements and uh, how all the different benefits that a rover would provide that would be part of the, all the EVAs. So, 
but it's, it's a, again a cost issue whether you you have to have a rover um, and then it, again it gets back then again to probabilistic risk assessment to put a number on you know you you're somewhere you want to be below one percent uh, for important risk and what you really need to have a knowledge of what these events are their energy spectrum to see to justify whether you have to have a rover or is it just something that is an extra benefit in the in the theme of a lara so that's so that's an ongoing study these rovers and coming up with potential rover designs the idea now is we're looking at rovers that you ride in as opposed to ride on is there a consideration in balancing the radiation exposure of crew members going to retrieve lunar specimens with autonomous rovers that could be driven from within the habitat and you could actually envision a combination of autonomous rovers with another rover that you can ride in to take crew members out to do spacewalk so where is the trade-off and risk in that analysis and then mary for yourself how does that fit in with our space radiation forecasting capability for lunar EVAs and how do we integrate all that? Yeah, I agree that you have to look at the integrated picture of um, the th automated rover is also what, what shielding the habitat would have versus the shielding because you know once you're in an event you have to go into some other shelter that has perhaps more sh shielding but do you have to consider what's 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 going to be the cumulative risk across each piece of each segment of the, the exposure? And I think to add on to that, it's um, how do you apportion the risk, which is a career risk or lifetime risk to the, to the crew member, how do you apportion it over the suite of vehicles? Um, and I think that becomes very difficult, Dave, because, again, as Marcella says, this is all in flux. So you're going to be doing some set of trades as the architecture matures, and you're somewhat going to be driven by what is being currently designed in Orion, and then these next set of vehicles that will follow. So you're going to be apportioning that risk. So it will play into that, that prediction possibility. We could look at some, and I, for lack of a better word, postulated number of events that could occur and, and some assumptions based on timeline where that crew member might be, and then look towards the mission and say, this is what the total risk to that crew member prior to the mission could be, but then have to make adjustments along the way. I, I see it so far in flux, it's hard to really comment you know, definitively, because the, you know, the rover's not decided on. Clearly, there's a trade between always having your crew members go EVA and using some sort of autonomous set of rovers, and there's a trade there, and there's a cost there as well, um, and those will all have to be balanced. But I think the, <clears throat> the takeaway is that we're somehow going to have to figure out how we apportion, if you will, part of the risks to each of the vehicles. Amy? Time may also be on your side. Right now, you're, you're, uh, you still haven't finalized your mission architecture, and that's probably a good thing because the research community is trying to help. Mm -hmm. And you have both um, incremental, small incremental improvements in risk prediction on the basis of sort of classical improvements and, and additional <coughs> data collection. But then there's also a phenomenon in, in science that's been pointed out and will be in the upcoming report from the National Academy of paradigm shifts or major improvements or conceptual uh, uh, changes in how we think about uh, biological uh, systems and, and how they perform. And so those, those the Academy is sort of looking at as occurring, those major changes in how we view how we view uh, bio biology and the performance of biological systems is happening maybe every five years. So if you give us a little more time, we'll probably be able to help you a lot more. But I, I'm not the one driving the mission requirements so or the timeline. <laughs> and to add about your, your question of forecasting in relation to EVA planning, um, as the lunar missions evolved, of course, we're going to start off with sortie missions that um, are shorter in length with numerous EVAs with specific mission objectives. And those uh, from the space or the SPE forecasting, that's going to be very critical because losing an EVA out of, uh, is very critical at that point. Um, so that's going to demand uh, better accuracy from the space weather folks on how to predict likelihoods of events so we can drive uh, answers to the flight team. For long-term outpost missions where you're there for a lot longer time, 
the all clear forecast becomes more important such that we could uh, if we know we're going to have a period of all clear in the following so many days that would allow for some flexibility for planning and the criticality of doing an eva on an outpost is not as uh, maybe as viewed as mission critical as on a sortie so it's going to be a slow evolution of how we handle that between a sortie based lunar uh, uh, and a lunar outpost <clears throat> I would very much like to hear from Dr. Cronenberg and perhaps others kind of a big picture assessment or what is the current thinking, say, among NRC councils and the like about the best strategies, how best to prioritize the research into biological effects of radiation, particularly low-dose radiation, with reference to you know what can be derived feasibly from clinical studies in the uh, uh, radiation therapy patients versus what must come from tissue culture studies or from whole animal studies? Well, maybe I, I can address this a little bit, and I hope others will comment. Um, there's information from the radiotherapy community, but it's largely fractionated exposures, and the doses are not, are not small. Uh, information can be gathered and has been gathered uh, with regard to uh, effects outside the main field, uh, for example, scatter doses. Right? But even there, uh, dose reconstruction for radiotherapy requires a lot of effort on the part of the medical physicist to give you that kind of information uh, reliably because every patient is treated differently. So I'm not saying that it's not possible to get information from there, and NASA and other agencies are spending their time doing that. The Department of Energy has a large radiation research effort addressing low-dose risks, risks below 10 centigrade. Um, their issues are different than NASA's. Uh, this is a consideration for um, the economic and social and other impacts of exposures uh, largely to occupational workers. Um, dose rate is being considered in some of that research as well. Uh, but one of the things that's been learned from some of the research that DOE has sponsored and some of that has been jointly sponsored by NASA is that uh, biological effects at very low doses may be uh, categorically different uh, there's over, than at high doses. And so many of those studies have been done looking initially at, for example, gene expression profiles. Um, there are, uh, are proteins, uh, or there are genes that respond at low dose, there are genes that respond at high dose. There's an overlap amongst some of them. But what we don't know enough about yet from those studies, I think, is how to interpret those results in terms of biological outcome. So I think we're a long way from integrating that information into risk analysis for a program such as NASA's uh, Space Radiation Protection Program. But there's a strong interest in developing those kinds of approaches to ask those questions. Uh, more important, and I think that something that may give us more concrete information in the near term is the development of the facility in New York to address chronic low dose rate exposures to the relevant proton uh, spectra that are associated with any one of several SPEs, M modeling, the, modeling the dose delivery, the affluence uh, delivery on the basis of what we know from historical SPE that have been characterized as well as they could be at the time that they occurred. And so this capability um, is now being validated at Brookhaven. And the idea also, I believe, is to go to large field size. And the reason for that is you're going to have a trade-off between uh, the amount of time you're going to have to have the accelerator running to do those kind of long-term chronic exposures. I mean, for those of you who work, for example, on the issue of bed rest for uh, unloading uh, the skeleton and knowing how long you have to leave somebody on bed rest before you start to see an effect. I mean, we're talking about the same types of long-term low-dose rate 
exposures, but not that long, right? SPEs don't usually last that long. But if you really wanted to pr provide an SPE simulator on the ground, uh, to me that seems to be the, the biggest thing to come down the pike, and it's just about here now. So uh, with a large field size, there's some other, uh, other bells and whistles that need to be added on, but it's coming, and that will help a lot. No, we expect it will be with every kind of biological system you want to throw at it, that we're allowed to throw at it, I should say. <laughs> we, we have some constraints from the IACUC. <laughs> well, in some, in, in this, in this, at this point, I think we need to conclude. That's our time. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for the magnificent contribution. And uh, Petrov, Dr. Petrov will, will oh, you want to say okay. uh, just finish? Or? I think the free practice on the surgery first. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I think Dear colleagues, I, I, I hope that we discuss very important problem and now we maybe uh, obtain additional information that permit us to more clearly obtain the uh, degrees of radiation hazard connected with radiation exposure during the moon mission. Especially we concentrate our attention on the problem of uh, solar particle events, radiation risk, and I hope that we estimate the difference between radiation risk that was used during the flight uh, near-Earth flight missions and radiation risk that must be taken into account for estimating the radiation hazard during the moon missions. I hope that problems uh, concerned during our um, session was interesting for you and you will take into your account investigation to your investigation the possible influence of radiation impact because one aspect of the radiation hazard composition of influence of various negative factors on radiation health on health of men during the uh, moon mission it's a very important problem, and we must take into account all sources of risk for estimation the radiation and not radiation, the medical hazard during the Mars mission. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.